Coming up on Mac Break Weekly, we dive into those rumors. We've got AR glasses, AR headsets, everything AR. Plus, hmm, Renee Ritchie isn't here, and there's a rumored MacBook Pro on the way, possibly 16 inches. Plus, a DJ with his beeps and boops is playing with the new Mac Pro. And I think Alex Lindsay really wants to get his hands on it. Stay tuned. You don't want to miss it. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is Twit. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 687, recorded November 12th, 2019. Alex as a service. This episode of MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV. IT Pro TV provides IT training that's effective and entertaining with access to virtual labs and practice tests. Visit go.itpro.tv slash MacBreak for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. Use code MacBreak30 at checkout. And by LastPass, a personal password manager and identity solution for businesses all in one. You only need one master password and LastPass remembers the rest. Visit lastpass.com slash twit to learn more. And by Plex. With Plex, you can organize and stream your personal collection of movies, TV shows, music, and photos anywhere on any device. Go to plex.tv slash twit and enter code twit10 to get $10 off a lifetime Plex Pass subscription. This offer applies to new subscribers only. Hello and welcome back to Mac Break Weekly. It's the show where we talk about Macs and break things. I think. Is that how, is that how this works? Uh, but we, but we, we do them very, very weekly, so they're very, very easy to fix if there's any visual damage to begin with. <laughs> uh, there are Macs. There are app, there's all sorts of Apple stuff. There's everything in between. Uh, and I am excited that things have returned to a bit of normalcy because Alex Lindsay is here in the studio <laughs> with me again. Hello, hello. Hello, Alex Lindsay of Pixel Core. Uh, yeah, so we had you with Andy last week, and you know it was getting as Andy mentioned, it was getting a little bit too clicky, and so <laughs> I said they, separate these two. Yeah, I, I think said, no, I, I you know clicky is that, is that a synonym for the balance of power had shifted uh-huh. dangerously close to the East Coast for one damn week, That's and exactly. somebody couldn't take it. I don't know. I don't know who that somebody was, but I will say that you know somebody had to be a diva and say, listen, I'm not going on that show again unless this changes. I don't know who that was, though. It wasn't me. Well, well, Alex. We're all I, just I, taking I, I, turns. I, I, I get Alex next. Yeah, I'm, exactly. And I, I, just, I just hope, Alex, that the gift basket that you got today was as big and plentiful as the gift basket with the, the cheeses and the hams and the, <laughs> and the, uh-huh. and the USB chargers. The Thanksgiving turkeys. Yeah, that was pretty good. Uh, it's all there. We, of course, also have Lori Gill, iMore's managing editor. Hello, Lori. That's me. How's it going? I have a little bit of room in here. I could bring Alex to sit next to me and we can snuggle up in front of my tiny computer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm up in Sacramento actually relatively often. So oh, really? oh, yeah. It wouldn't be hard. We should we'll we should have a remote show where you come I to my just, office. I just I just travel around and we just find the different. Uh, I, then I have to go to I have, yes. to, I have to go visit Renee Ooh. and have some great. Yeah. So so this yep. this would be this would be very very contemporary for what Apple is doing. We, we're we're launching Alex as a service. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that great quip came from WGBH's Andy Anatko. And as I said before, Andy Anatko's Andy Anatko. Doggone it! You are a force to be reckoned <laughs> I'm very- with. I'm very self-possessed. You're correct. It's been commented on before. Uh, well, we're all here, except for Leo, who will be returning uh, next week. Uh, the vacation is coming to an end, and I can hear the groans all the way from the United States as uh, he comes to that realization that he has to end the vacation. <laughs> but uh, I'm sure you're all looking forward to having him back. Until then, let's get into it. Uh, so we gotta we got to start with the rumors. Again, this is Mac Break Weekly, so we're breaking the rumors. I don't know. I'm trying. Uh, and it starts with uh, Apple's plans for AR and VR. Tim Cook has said, yeah, AR is pretty cool. In some form or another, in every single one of the uh, earnings calls, for as long as I had been uh, transcribing them. And I don't know if he's still doing that, Lori, but he certainly had been talking up AR for some time. And it's maybe clear now why, according to sources familiar with the matter, sources close to the company, sources this, sources that, uh, Apple is working on 
a mixed reality system that starts with a headset and then later becomes just glasses. So, Lori Gill, are you excited for Apple Glasses? So, you know, I, I've said this before, um, AR and VR right now are not quite consumer level. It's It still seems a little far off to me. Well, I, th I think the rumor is 2022, right? So mm -hmm. we've got a couple of years for that. Mm -hmm. um, the use cases for them don't seem to be quite s strong enough to be presenting something worthwhile. And, and Apple's, you know, I, I, I don't think Apple would enter this market until it feels that it has a good consumer product. With that in mind, though, AR has gotten a lot better at becoming something we could use every day, especially in terms of um, outdoor use and in, in this idea of, you know, being able to have your map um you look out and you see buildings and it shows you what that, what the address is or mm -hmm. what the building is like, what the business is. So that kind of thing definitely potentially could be great for just a pair of glasses in terms of the mixed reality headset, something more like, you know, the, the VR headsets that we're familiar with right now. I don't know. Apple hasn't won in terms of gaming, even with Apple arcade, Apple arcade is not as popular on Mac as it is on um, iOS and Apple TV and stuff. So, you know, a mixed reality type headset, you know, that would be like a VR headset doesn't seem like it would be something that would, you know, go over that well. So I don't know. It's, it still seems a little early. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to see how this plays out and maybe big things are happening in the next two years. That'll make it worthwhile for Apple to launch something that soon. I seem to see them kind of laying a base. I don't know uh, how, how folks feel about this, but we have right now the new iPhones that include this uh, wide band, ultra wide band chip in them. And this ultra wide band chip is going to give some spatial awareness in a way that we have not had up to this point. Uh, after that, according to the Bloomberg article uh, by Mark Gurman, we are going to see an iPad Pro in theory, allegedly, reportedly, uh, in the first half of 2020 that's going to have a 3D system that lets people create three-dimensional reconstructions of rooms, objects, and people. Now, it starts there in the iPad, then it comes to the iPhone. So suddenly you have an iPhone that can do 3D mapping. You've got an ultra-wideband chip inside. You've got these little Apple tags hanging out in your place. And you have companies taking advantage of these uh, th this spatial awareness with UWB. And... In that world, I can start to see where AR suddenly makes sense. If all of these devices and Apple's doing you know, d differential privacy and things like that to keep everybody's uh, personal data protected, but if a billion iPhones in people's pockets, y'all, uh, <laughs> if you've got all of that data out there that's doing the mapping, then suddenly I can see a world that they're building well, with AR. Google's tried to do that. So it's not it's not necessarily, I mean, the, the, the idea of, of mapping from your phone is is interesting, but I mean, I, I do a lot of mapping. And so mm -hmm. a mixture of LIDAR photogrammetry, and then I've used, you know, there's been a variety of laser based versions or, or some version of mapping that has been relatively inexpensive or phone based for, you know, three or four years now. Uh, and, and that's been hard to get off the ground because it hasn't been very clean. You know, the data isn't very clean. Now, what it does do is allow you to uh, improve your positional data. So mm -hmm. if you look at, um, if you look at what the you know USB Bluetooth or I'm sorry Bluetooth LE is going to get you down to three or four feet you know of of location, mm -hmm. but uh, theoretically the ultra wideband will be much better than that. And yeah. when we start getting into a smaller box where we know mostly where the phone is, what that does is it reduces the number of variables as we start to hash out that that data, this room data. So I know that I only have to search, you know, if, if I know where your phone is and roughly where it's pointed. I can very quickly figure out exactly where you are in that room down to the millimeter, at least where the phone is, right? right, to, right. You know, because because when you're when you see those little points and things are tracking and not slipping, that means I know exactly where your phone is. Mm -hmm. And so mixed with that, it, it allows me to very very closely pinpoint your positional data. Now that uh, has some, inf as as Lori alluded to, it has some great opportunities for just knowing where things are and how to find things. But it also has incredible opportunities. If you think about a museum, being able to build you a digital tour that is based exactly where you're looking, exactly what you're looking at, mm -hmm. and giving you a whole bunch of, uh, of extra information, annotations via AR, and, mm -hmm. um, you know, extra bits and pieces. And that can be done whether it's a, you know, you're going through restoration hardware, it's showing you things that it, this could be done and how this is assembled. And you, know, you can be basically add enormous amounts of data 
to um, uh, to to what you're looking at mm -hmm. uh, with the AR if you really know where you're at and you really know the context of what you're what you're looking for. And so that is available on the that's going to be available on the phone. I mean, that could be available right now. That, this right. is just a limitation of people making the content. So there's a lot of it. Google has been playing with this for a long time. The real problem was is the attempt to make it easy. Like, oh, we, we have a phone walk when we walk through and map it. You just get bad data. So in the areas where we've taken LIDAR and mixed that with photogrammetry, you know, so we have both structured and unstructured data, uh, essentially now you get incredible amounts of, of, of uh, to work with, you know, of, of data to, to, to deal with. And so I think that you know, we can keep on playing with the phones and I think that we'll be able to do some stuff with it. And w there are lots of apps that do this now where you can kind of scan a bit of something here and there, but to really get it working for big locations, mm -hmm. I think they're going to need to use um, bigger tools. Now, the great thing is, the, the thing that's most interesting, I think it, almost anybody can download it now. I think you, you might need a developer, but the um, Reality Composer. Yes. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Been playing anybody should play with you, Reality Composer. So, you know, you download it, play with it, uh, because now you're getting to see a codeless ability to throw things, you know, out there. You can throw things in there, you can give them some behaviors and so on and so forth and throw them, throw them out there. And that is... Apple reducing the amount of work it takes by 10x <laughs> to to be able to start building the core components for an AR experience, um, and so you're you're seeing that kind of go down the path. Um, USD. The other thing to keep your eye on is USDZ. So USD is the Universal Scene Description, which is Pixar's uh, trans transport uh, file format. Apple added a Z to it, which is zip, I think. I think mm -hmm. it's just that they, they zips down into a single <laughs> file. It's like, you know, like, I, and I, you know, the, uh, I'm sure the Pixar was like, oh, I really wish I had thought of that. <laughs> so anyway, so, um, so anyway, by zipping it up, it makes it a, com a compact piece. Now we're not seeing that rolling out everywhere just yet. So, uh, you know, but USDZ, I think, I hope is going to eventually, we're going to see it in all the apps that Apple makes, other people's apps that are, you know, starting to come out. There's Some furniture stores have been using it a little bit. I've right. seen uh, the, what's the, it's a, it's a game. It's a game console, a little yellow game console mm. made by the folks at Panic, I think. Who's it made? I can't oh, remember. Oh, right, right. Panic makes it. Yeah. yeah, Panic makes it. And they have used the USDZ format right. to show well, you it on a table. And the advantage of the USDZ the USDZ format is that it's not just geometry. It's the geometry, it's the texture maps, it's the lighting, it's the behaviors, it's the animation. All of those things can be put into one format and then and then made available. Now, the, some of that, getting that to work with everything is still a big challenge, but so we're seeing all these pieces coming together and and it's not there yet, uh, but but we, uh, but we I think that it's it's really exciting. And, and when you start really thinking and playing with uh, some of the ideas, there's a, there's a lot that could be done I'm mostly interested in from an educational perspective, right? But there's but there's a lot of places that can be done for entertainment and, and PR as well. Now you named two yeah. you named two terms. Uh, uh, you named you named lidar, which I understand. Mm -hmm. What was the other one that you named, and what how does that one work? So photogrammetry is uh, basically uh, it's another way that we gather uh, scene data. Okay. So um, basically, what you can do is you can take photos of a given object from different angles, and this is just standard photos. You can do it with your iPhone. And um, the best, the easiest one to use uh, is a program called MetaShape, in my opinion. It used to be called, I think, uh, was it Photoscan? No, it wasn't Photoscan. It was, um, anyway, so MetaShape is the one that I kind of use a lot. And so basically what you do is you take a series of photos from different angles mm -hmm. and not straight on. You think that you want to take them front, side, whatever, but you actually want to shoot angles so that they, uh, you have vanishing points. And so basically you shoot your object and what it does is it says, okay, I'm going to look at all the points in every photo mm -hmm. that are features, you know, little, these things look, uh, I, um, these look unique okay. for these photos. Then it takes all those unique, those, those unique patterns and it compares them to all the other photos. Mm. And it says, where can I find the same pattern in all the other photos? And so it goes, goes out and looks and, and, and attaches them all. If it can get at least eight to 12 per pair between the, the two pairings. And it says, okay, these are the same. Now, when I look at it and if I have vanishing points, I can figure out, I can actually reverse engineer where the cameras were. I see. And I can figure out what their focal length was. I can figure out a lot of other things. Now, we, it doesn't have to figure out focal length because usually when you take the picture, it's in the metadata, right? Mm -hmm. so, so anyway, so it takes these photos. It, it finds the, the features. It then reverse engineers where the cameras are. Now, once it knows where the cameras are, their focal length and, mm -hmm. and everything else, it can now figure out where every other point was. It can basically uh. build a depth map 
within uh, of every photo, and then from there extract uh, surface points, mm -hmm. and then from there extract geometry. And so you can actually build very complex 3D models from simple photographs. And okay. and so um, the the problem with it is is there's no scale, and and oftentimes there's there's like areas that you can't see. So what you do is you by mixing the lidar, this is what we call structured structured data with the unstructured data, which is the uh, photogrammetry, you're able to actually um, get all of the, the best of both worlds. You get the detail from the photogrammetry, you get the structure from the LIDAR, and you end up with very, very accurate and highly detailed um, data. And this is going to be a, a big deal today. Unreal just bought, um, oh, now I just, my, my brain just turned off. Um, it's, it's a company that I've been, I've been tracking for a while. It's, um, uh, they just, I bought Quixel. <laughs> so there's a little company called Quixel and it was a little press release that if you weren't watching both Quixel and Unreal, you probably wouldn't notice. Right. But what they do is they use photogrammetry and LIDAR to build lots and lots of real-time 3D assets, you know, okay. and, and assets for Unreal and so on and so forth. So that library coming to Unreal is going to be a big deal. And so, um, but you're seeing Unreal's paying attention to this. Unity is now, you know, looking at this. And these are the big, the two big companies dealing with uh, real-time 3D data on any every platform. Those are the two big, big players. And so um, it's kind of amazing, by the way, that Apple hasn't bought one of them. <laughs> you know, so, so, They're but, waiting for them to buy the other one so they can just buy the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. So, so anyway, so the, uh, but uh, these are the two big players um, in this market. And uh, so by, the, by Unreal grabbing this, it's really started an arms race. But this photogrammetry is, by the way, it's just, even if you never use it for work, it's, it's my it's my favorite pastime. Like when I'm walking around, I take pictures of stuff all the time just to build 3D models yeah. out of it. Wow! So is this like a is this a program you have to use to make that happen? Yeah, Metascan. You, just... you can download um, Metascan, and I think you can get a demo version that is free, and then you you can pay a monthly fee if you want to actually export stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, it's I, there. I think there might be some free ones out there. I use Metascan because it's easy to um, uh, it's easy to it's really easy to use. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but it's. There, there was a 3D one two three capture one Catch, two three yeah. capture that Autodesk put out, which was the old photos, old, old image modeler, you know, uh, uh, code put into this, uh, and then they turned it off. It was very frustrating. Hmm. So <laughs> oh, that's, yeah. that's upsetting, Andy. Uh, um, well, uh, just back to the idea of Apple making AR glasses. I, I, find, I just find it hard to imagine what they could make within the next five years that would fit what we expect from Apple and what we expect when we think about a, uh, augmented reality glasses. It's, it feels like uh, putting humans in a spaceship and sending them to sending them to Mars. That uh, it's uh, that that's that's great, and you you see the utility of it. But you still have the problem of well, how do you keep these people safe from radiation, and how do you run like a two year two year long mission? Um, you with the with AR glasses, you get down to how do you get enough processing power in the glasses, even just to uh, maintain collect data and maintain communications with a phone in your pocket that's doing the most of the calculation. How do you have this uh, all, all this uh, this imaging hardware? To uh, put something over your, put something in your field of vision that can run for an appreciable amount of time on a battery that you could that wouldn't require some sort of a chest harness uh, to, <laughs> to build in the frame of glasses. And then even if you did, uh, how, how do you have the sort of any sort of an imager that again can usefully place objects in your field of vision that don't make these things look like a hockey mask. And then finally, even if you did solve all those problems, how do you uh, how do you create uh, a piece of technology that people are going to want to put on their faces if, if particularly if they don't uh, if they don't use uh, uh, prescription glasses to begin with and th then you get into apple is apple would have to do a whole lot of communication saying that well i know that we're the we uh, you, you associate hey look the person you're talking to has a camera pointed at your face at all times while they're talking to you well, that's more of a facebook or a google thing but trust us we're not going to make it creepy in any way <laughs> shape or form but it, the, the thing that makes so i i'm i was really skeptical when people were predicting it for next year, I'm still skeptical at 2022. I'm thinking that in 20 in another five years, maybe, but I just don't get it. But one thing though in, in Apple's favor is that 
uh, with the Apple Watch, they did prove that they understand uh, the importance of design in selling a technology that uh, I don't think that the I don't think the Apple Watch would have uh, gained all that traction if they had if they had built something that looked like uh, an Android Wear watch or one of the Samsung Gear watches, you know, and uh, a can of tuna uh, on your wrist with a with with, with a, a nine volt battery stuck inside <laughs> it. It looks like even even when the, the Apple Watch is turned off as a static item, it looks like a very, very pretty watch that you might want to if you saw it in a, in a display case in a jewelry store, you might want to take a look at it even before you knew what it was. And so if any company could make a set of spectacles that people would be willing to put on their face because not only is it very, very pretty, but it also shows, oh, look, I, 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 I can afford this luxury brand of Apple. They could do it, but again, I'm, I'm, this is on this is on my list of things that I will believe when I actually see Tim Cook or Tim Cook's third generation clone <laughs> on stage, <laughs> actually wearing them and demonstrating them in an event. Well, and I, I think that. Do you think they'll be in white? Do you think they'll only make them in white? <laughs> oh Lord, <laughs> not. I hope not. Well, and I and I, I don't know what they're doing with glasses, but but I what I will say is that the that you're seeing two very different approaches to the same problem, which is that you know Google. Uh, well, oftentimes just do something where we're, we're going to experiment with everybody. Right. You know, we're going to just throw it out there. Mm -hmm. We're going to have everyone play with it. We're going to see what works and, and try to error correct from that. And that's just, and I'm not saying one way one is, is better right than the other. other. I'm just saying it, it, this is a, a clear vision of how the two companies work that's very distinct from each other. So Google is, we're going to throw it out there. We're going to hit it, see what sticks to the wall. We're going to then, you know, turn some stuff off, turn other things on. We're going to learn from what's what's happening. Apple is building an infrastructure mm -hmm. that is, you know, piece by piece by piece. You know, where we started off a couple of years ago with the basic tracking, you know, with those nice little wood tables that are easy to track. And, um, <laughs> you know, and and, uh, and then we have, uh, you know, when we throw a box up there and we have, we have Weta do something and then we have Minecraft do something. And every year there's like this little progression. Now we have USDZ and now we have... You know, we're, we're adding the, these little bits and pieces, and that's how Apple. But it, it just—it's a great vision. It shows you the difference between the two companies. I think that Apple moves really slowly because it does that way. It does it well, that way? Yeah. Right. But and Google also—you don't know whether you should commit to it because it might you don't go know away. how long it's going to last. Yeah. Well, but the, to and this this is another point that we haven't really considered. What if Apple's plans for if they have, have plans for an actual like. A tr what we think of as a traditional augmented reality pair of goggles or glasses, what if they're planning to do it the way that Microsoft is doing HoloLens or the way that uh, Google is doing Glass, where they're, they're are, they are not selling them to consumers to walk around the street with these on. They're selling these to enterprise. And to people HoloLens has been really successful to, as well. Like it's, exactly. So, yeah. so, may, so maybe Apple is planning like a, 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 a Apple Glasses Pro <laughs> for like for two two to three thousand dollars a pair that architectural firms will wear will wear and scientific applications will wear uh, will buy not in not in huge Apple Watch quantities but enough quantities that when they the te technology comes along to build a thousand dollar pair or, or maybe even a five hundred dollar pair of consumer glasses they figure they've they've got the software all locked down and now they know exactly how to adapt it so you may be right but the so there's the original article before bloomberg came out with their report the information had an excellent report about uh, apple's ar headset and glasses with the headset coming first the glasses coming later this was a presentation that reportedly they gave to uh, enough employees to fill the 1,000 seat Steve Jobs Theater. And that is, according to the people, uh, rather unprecedented. In fact, they each had these little. Um these little stickers that were placed, tamper-proof stickers that were placed over their iPhones with QR codes on them <laughs> so that if they were ever tampered to take photos of anything, then they would Just, know exactly and, and, who it was. And for those of us who work in production on these kinds of events, that's standard. Like so, That part, right. Stickers on, on cameras mm -hmm. is something that... I just get used to, you know, you just put stickers on your, on your, and it, they're kind of useless, but it makes everyone feel better. Right. And so <laughs> this, uh, for a thing just targeted at, at, at a specific market like that, I, there are a lot of people that are involved in this. Um, one of the things that they talk about here is the fabrics and the materials that they want to use, even on this headset, before we even get to the glasses, to make this light enough to where people can wear it as often as possible, which I'm... I'm not sold on a on a HoloLens style device, a mixed reality headset that works for both AR and VR that 
I would wear anywhere other than in a specific setting for VR. If I'm in my home and I've got my padded walls that are going to keep me safe as I'm walking around, sure. But I don't see myself personally walking around with the headset. But the way that they talk about it is it's, it's, they're trying to design it for longevity uh, in terms of, of wearability. Has anyone used the Magic Leap? Uh, yes. And what did you think? Uh, I thought that it was a really spectacular experience with the usual limitation of uh, it, it, it will it will it will deliver really, really convincing imagery in, in your field of vision, but no peripheral vision. And so mm -hmm. whoever is creating the content, you have to make sure that everything if, if something enters the frame, it has to like do a genie appear right in front of you uh, or like walk from from the distance. They can't they can't uh, same limitation as HoloLens, where you're basically looking at a screen that's in front of you. It's just that it's transparent and invisible. But the overall effect was very, very nice. The uh, the fact that you it was bulky because of the 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 cabling and this this pod you had to have on your hip, but it, as a, as an effect, it worked very well. If I and if I had to do uh, training for three or four hours, let's say at, at a stretch, uh, or if I were even being a creator, if I were being an architect who is walking me myself and my team through a, through a place and trying to say, well, what if a, what will this look like at 3 p.m. in the winter? Like, okay, great. So we need to adjust that window this way or that way. I could also see why you need to have comfort because uh, it's it's you can't get anything done in 20 minutes apart from give a demo that hopefully will let the Department of Defense order a thousand of them. If you actually want to get work done, you need to give create something. People People are going to wear for a, a full work session. That's, I think that's exactly where it's the, the AR stuff is just not really, in my opinion, ready yet. Is the what's the use case for something like this? What's the use case for a pair of AR VR glasses that you wear on your head while you're working, for example? There's ideas out there that sound fantastic, but they haven't been able to accomplish that kind of that kind of productivity and comfort at the same time. If I had a pair of glasses on my face that could call up a browser at any time that I needed it, uh, you know, and I wouldn't have to do anything except, you know, tap a couple things in the air. That is a fantastic idea, but it's also, we're not ready for that. We're not ready for that kind of, of workflow in our day to day. So it, it definitely would have to be something that's, that revolutionizes the way we use technology, the way we use computers. And this has been done before. I mean, the iPhone and the iPad or smartphones and tablets, they did that. We went from computers to tablets and most people don't even have a computer in their house anymore because tablets have and, and smartphones have replaced that. So there's potential for someday um, AR or VR or mixed reality glasses or headsets to replace what we're comfortable with in terms of computing but it's certainly I it's it, the the use cases for it just does don't seem to mesh in my opinion with what people need to do on the day to day. Um, I, maybe maybe it's it, it could be a niche thing for for um, entertainment, you know, for people who work in like graphic design and um, film editing and things like that. I I I don't I, I've done a lot of both, <laughs> so <laughs> I think about it in a, in a way that you know that is. Uh, that there are many places where it comes to like, for instance, training. Um, there are things like, for instance, I was, um, I was playing with, there, there was a, the union, I can't think of which union, union is one of the Teamsters unions. Okay. At, at Vallejo, at the Vallejo um, uh, farmer's market, they had like this little tiny crane and it's like a crane. It's 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 as if it would look like a little toy, but it was a very industrial toy. It's what they use to train <laughs> crane operators. Okay, wow. so so you have the two joysticks, yeah, and you sit there and you play with it, and you have to pick little things up and you know put things down. You right. know, like hook it onto this and move it around. So it, it, you build up your understanding of what the two joysticks do uh, because okay. they there's a lot that you you and know six degrees of, of separate and, you know six yeah. degrees of freedom on a crane and you and if you screw it up you're going to kill people or yeah. or drop a building or whatever so it's be good to be you know, yeah you got to get good at it right yeah so <laughs> so anyway so they use this thing as a training uh, device mm -hmm. and I very quickly realized like this is a good example of something that would be great in AR yeah where or VR where you put the goggles on and now I I can feel the, feel it and uh -huh. it's integrating my experience with that process now. I want to make sure that you have this totally down right. and totally have the feel of it uh, before you actually interact with the full device, mm -hmm. you know, and some of the stuff that, that I was working on as early as the mid nineties was 
um, off, was actually for um, military and police officer training, which was, uh, there was a, a, a technology called FATS. And, um, and basically what you would do is, it was big screens, mm -hmm. you know, like that were in front of you, it wasn't VR. And basically it would put you in situations, stre high stress situations that you would um, make, have to make decisions quickly, mm. you know? And so it's a lot of what we think of where you, you put a bunch of targets or you have an interaction and, but they had, I mean, they had really great tools for the, for the big ones. I mean, they had, they had a shoulder mounted launcher that had, oh my that had word. compressed air. So you sit there and you'd fire to go, you know, like, you know, and, and, then, well. and then the screen would go, you know, and it would fly wow. off and, and, um, and, and then you see a tank go. That's like a Disney you know, experience. Oh, it was the ultimate <laughs> Disney experience. Anyway. So, uh, but the, um, and I, Ironically, the reason I was looking at this stuff was to use photogrammetry. But back then, oh. we had to like we had to make it by hand. It was like we'd make little boxes and things like that. And so, um, anyway, so but what was interesting there is that when I look at VR, I think that was a very we had big big projectors and screens that were all blended together. VR would make that much more right, uh, you know, inter interactive and, and cost so, effective. If you don't have to build, even if you don't have to build a bunch of those right. little uh, crane things that you were talking about, where you could train up. 12 people and you know you don't have people waiting to be able well, they to do it at home the tools yeah you know like literally you could send you could send a bunch of crane operators you know stuff at home with an oculus and a, and a specialized joystick mm -hmm. that this whatever the device was that I, my, that my daughter was using at this farmer's market um whatever that that device is that was expensive you right. know and this is something that for a couple hundred dollars you could have people go to a local local location and use or or other things like that and so so i think that especially when it comes to training and it comes to learning things i think that there's a lot of opportunities to uh to have ar and vr be something that's compelling i don't think that it always has to be something that i'm going to put on for hours you know the right right some of the things like for instance with hololens that they've been really successful at in construction is i throw this thing on for a minute I look out and now I can see where all my pins are going to come up and where, you know, all I have is survey data right now. Mm -hmm. You know, I have flags, you know, up there. And instead, I, I now can see what's actually going to be there, where those flags are going to turn into beams and everything yeah. else. And that helps me visualize what I'm looking at in a way that is very difficult. It's one of the big problems you have in construction is not seeing what your what those flags mean right um and so being able to kind of visualize where we are and where we're going with that and that's only you put it on for a couple minutes you look out there you have a discussion about where it's going and how it's working and then you take it off and so i don't think that it necessarily has to be something that you're going to have on all day or even a couple hours i think a lot of ar and vr solutions could be something that could be done very quickly the biggest problem you have with that is the startup process you throw on a VR goggles and there's all this stupid stuff that you have to do to get to where you're trying to go. And it's this, you know, it, and, and that's the thing that I don't feel like anybody has done very well is that when I put my V, like I put an Oculus on and now I really technically have to know what I'm doing. Right. And there's a whole bunch of bumping around that you can't just hand it to somebody and have them throw it on and have it be a fluid experience. And I think that's been one of the big problems with uh, execution. The problem is if you if you start training people in this way, then you remove the possibility for uh, accounts like Cursed Architecture to exist on Twitter, where a lot of the times they're showing off these horrifying um, creations. Well, so, so for example, if you could see ahead of time, I don't know if we can show my screen here. But did uh, they do that on purpose? Well, maybe they did, but th this kind of thing, <laughs> I don't know what's going on here and why why this is allowed. Uh, for folks that don't know, this, it's at Cursed Architecture on Twitter, and it basically just people submit these horrifying architectural nightmares uh, that people have created. And sometimes there's probably <laughs> reasons for why these exist the way that they do. Well, without European and American code codes, a lot of things get done in, in a different way that it oftentimes is a little bit more... Um, Mm -hmm. uh, organic. You're, you're not talking about McMansion Hell, are you? That's one, one of my favorite. That's another, uh, yeah. Patreons, yeah. In in <laughs> in Rwanda, we had it. We had a, we had a hallway that didn't go anywhere. Oh man! Like it was like a whole hallway. We're like, I don't understand why this is even here. So it's, uh, but I think I think they just had extra space. Yeah. So I, it sounds like you know that there are some use cases that we can imagine right now, and we'll see if there are going to be use cases that we have uh, maybe as as consumers that either. Apple will make known to us or that we will start to see as other technology evolves around it. And we have to remember that many people thought that there was no reason to have an iPhone when Apple released it. Mm -hmm. like, why would you need anything more than a tree? Well, uh -oh. Uh, well, but remember that we had that, we had that thing already. We had the, the idea of having... 
No, I'm I'm, I'm saying that the. <sighs> I, I don't I don't think it's a great analogy because what you're talking about is here is an existing thing and it's, it's like the difference between a gas powered car and an electric car. It's the it's the same kind of thing only with different technology powering it. There's, people have already been conditioned to have imagine the, the first pitch saying we have this great idea. You know how like sometimes you want to get out of the house or get out of the office so that no one can reach you by phone. We have this technology this device that will cost you a lot of money and it will allow anybody to call you wherever you are you will never know a moment's peace we, we already we already have that kind of we already had that well in the bag before the the iPhone came out we're not we're not telling people to we're, we're telling people to put something on their faces that they're they've never put on their faces before we're telling people to ha get used to a kind of computing that they have never done before and I think this is going to be non-trivial which is which is why I think that when you do it uh, when you do it in enterprise when you do it for training when you do it for uh, the person who's using it, it's not the person who's paying for it and the person who's using it is kind of being told by their boss you have to use this that's the great place to incubate all this well, technology it seems to me that andy has forgotten about the virtual boy we've had this technology <laughs> <laughs> virtual virtual boy was was more of a pink eye uh, pink eye enabling system uh, <laughs> there, were, there, weren't, there weren't enough people kids with pink eye and this absolutely solved that problem so that's uh, that's a different thing I, you know the, the 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 number one use that we found for the for Google Glass was to be able to do point to point training mm -hmm. where I could see what you're looking at over Hangout. So you, I can see what you're looking at, you can see what I'm looking at, and I can sit there and talk to you about it. Mm -hmm. And then they turned it off. And you were like, okay, well, now I don't have any. Like, literally, I, I haven't used it. No, there's it no since. use for it. <laughs> yeah, you know, like it was just, it was just kind of like, okay, well, never mind. Well, we'll see what happens. Uh, but we have to talk about a noticeable absence in, in uh, our hearts and on the panel today. Uh, a certain Renee Ritchie is, is not here today. Mm. And at this same time, there have been some rumors suggesting that a 16-inch MacBook Pro could be coming as soon as tomorrow. Now, I don't know. I'm not drawing any connections. Uh, I'll leave those connections to you folks out there. Suppo supposedly I think they're giving briefings. actually on vacation and... with Georgia Dow. Oh, is that what it is, oh. Lori Gill? Now, that's, now what, you're the managing editor of what site again? I don't know. Am I going to get myself in trouble by saying anything? <laughs> all, all, all I know, all I know, is that as soon as as soon as I heard that rumor that there there are people flying into uh, Apple's briefing suite in New York City, I'm like, well, let's go to Instagram slash Instagram.com slash Renee Ritchie and see if there's a picture of an Apple Watch yes. going from <laughs> going to LaGuardia. Uh, and I didn't see that, which oh, means that either man. a yes, he's on vacation somewhere, or b Apple, the control freaks that they are, had little word with them saying, you know, every time you tweet that picture, the world knows that you're coming in for a briefing. We, we would do what you want. We would just be really, really happy if you didn't do that anymore. <laughs> That's a really good point. I, I hadn't thought about the, uh, the reading between the lines there. Uh, but th there's apparently going to be, uh, we've heard about this 16-inch MacBook Pro for quite some time. Uh, now, of course, there are rumors that the folks are being flown in to, to discuss uh, this 16-inch MacBook Pro. And Mark Gurman on Twitter was being lambasted because of some earlier thing, an earlier tweet where he said that the release was imminent. And then people were following up saying, imminent, you say? Well, uh, clearly it has not happened yet. But now, rumored uh, to be potentially released uh, tomorrow. So the it was kind of was it going to be released today as folks were getting their press briefings, or was it going to be tomorrow after that has happened with some uh, reviews of first what, looks? And I, what I, a I bunch have of to, weenies. <laughs> I, I do want to make it clear that I had, like no one has said anything to me. I don't know anything. That was just a funny haha -ha about Renee not being here. He yeah. probably <laughs> is on vacation with with Georgia. I don't know. In New York. Yeah, in New York, yep. he's there eating sushi or something, uh, as he is wont to do. But 16-inch MacBook Pro, uh, I just got this 15-inch MacBook Pro with Touch Bar. Uh, let's see, what is this? This is the ba -ba -ba, 2019 model, so it's yeah, from so this year. Yeah, it's a brand new one, right? I've been yeah. holding out. And, you know, I wish I would have held out. I've been, I've been, I, I was like, I'm going to let them sort this all out. I'm going to hold out on it. So I think this is my model coming, but I, I, <laughs> I still have a 2015 that I'm not allowed to fly with anymore in Asia, evidently. So, right. um, and so I, I've been hanging on for a long time. I, I'm going to have to, I know I'm going to have to give up the whole, I want my MagSafe back, I think. 
you know, that's the only thing. <laughs> I'm, but uh, but that's been the thing that has actually been the number one issue that I've had. But it's now just gotten too slow. So I'm excited. When I saw the Mac Pro, I was hoping that we were going to end up with a Mac Pro like MacBook Pro, but it doesn't look like that's going to be the case. I, no, I what yeah. I wanted was gnarly, heavy, long battery life, has a crazy processor. No, I'm not sure that that's what we're going to get because I feel like the the current Mac Pro should be the Mac, like the MacBook. Oh, interesting. You know, like like what they consider a MacBook Pro right now should be a MacBook, and then they should make one that is beefy. Actually, a pro. That's <laughs> actually yes. pro. Yeah, so this one's supposed to come with an updated uh, keyboard mechanism. It is now a scissor switch instead of the butterflies of times. I want past. clicky. I want clicky. You want full on clicky. Full on keys. clicky. Cherry switch. I think there's been mix. there's been rumor that it that it's like a hybrid version version like that Ugh. that it's going to be like kind of butterfly kind of scissor or it's like it's butterfly but they're going to use some of the scissor or mechanisms or something what's like that. Name? I remember Renee a, talking a, about what's that. What's the term for that language in 1984? Uh where they're newspeak. lying to you. Yeah, yeah. That feels Double like newspeak, yeah, newspeak a, a to poke, me. Yeah. They, they've, they've agreed to poke us in the eye with a slightly blunter stick now. It's no, <laughs> the, 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 key, the keyboard's a garbage fire start to finish. The sooner that they basically say we have a brand new keyboard design as opposed to, you know how we told you twice already that we fixed the problems with the old design and now it's perfect? Get ready again. I think that if 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 once again they show us a 0. 0.58 millimeter, let's go through that again. 0. 0.58 millimeter key travel keyboard. It's just garbage again. Which is funny. Is I like my. I I have I have one with the flat keys and I mean a smaller 12 inch, and I actually like my iPad keyboard better. In fact, I'd rather yeah. type I do on my iPad keyboard than on keyboard. that. I won't type anything very. Is, is that very is that the smart keyboard or yeah, the just, Apple smart keyboard? It's the mm -hmm. Apple smart keyboard. Yeah. I prefer that. Mm -hmm. I'd prefer to type on that than than the my little twelve inch that has the flat keys. I drives me yeah. crazy. I I think I I've just I've never really been. I think I'm. I, Renee uses the term keyboard agnostic. I've never really had a. a other than mechanical keyboards, those are difficult for me to type on. But otherwise, I, I flow from one keyboard to another without any sort of, you know, I don't worry about the bounce back or the tech tactileness or anything like that, the mushiness. Sometimes there are keyboards that feel a little mushier than others, but for the most part, it's never really been an issue for me. So like, I don't have a problem with the butterfly keyboard in terms of how it feels and how it works, except for the problems that the butterfly keyboard has had in the past. And <laughs> And, and apparently, and you know, I know, um, Micah, you've got the 2019 model and you're going to be the first one to know if the new model, um, has improved the keyboard or not, if you have an issue with it, but oh, cool. the last two iterations did still have problems. So maybe this third one doesn't. So in my opinion, if we stick with the butterfly keyboard for all time, I'm fine with it because I think it's a, it's, it's perfectly fine in terms of its usability, but they need to perfect the the problems with it, which is a completely different situation, you know. Yeah, and, and well, the, the, a keyboard is on a laptop is something that you can't avoid using, particularly when you're not making uh, MacBooks with uh, with touchscreens on them, and it's it's. It's no good to have to be experimenting on people who are who are spending sixteen hundred to three thousand dollars on right. what's supposed to be a premium laptop, and don't worry, we fixed it this time. Okay, well, we didn't really fix it last time, but we're going to fix it again this time. Uh, it's it's just that a keyboard is the is one of the simplest darn things to build. Uh, I, I, okay, I, I, re I realize that I'm oversimplifying things, but when's the last time you saw a premium notebook that said, "Wow, this keyboard is a total piece of crap"? Or even though, and the best the people can say about it is that, "Hey, I use it and I don't mind it," which is a, which is a totally legitimate point of view. I'm not saying that if people who who like it uh, are wrong or they're just not as good <laughs> as as important a typist as I am. Uh, but it's such an it seems like this is such a solved problem. There are companies that make laptops that are as thin as the MacBook. Pro that don't have to have this weird super flat keyboard. Mm -hmm. It really is. I, I will defend uh, earnestly the statement that this is 100% style over function, that this is not something that should have ever left the lab to begin with, and that the best move that Apple could make for the future of the MacBook is to simply not even have to say mea culpa, we, f we screwed up, but simply to say mysteriously enough we have decided to go with a completely more conventional design for the keyboard so that's that's that all i'm getting at is that 
the fact that you have a controversial keyboard design is in and of that hasn't hasn't shaken itself down uh, and fixed itself within one gen one iteration basically underscores that this is a problem and this is I'll, I've said it before and I've said it I'll say it again this is if app if I don't like the keyboard of the next uh, of the next generation of MacBooks my next notebook is going to be a thinkpad it's uh, I've got a thinkpad in front of me I love the keyboard I, there are other things I like about it I don't like Windows so much but the at this point the difference I think between Windows 10 and the latest version of Mac OS is not so broad that my dislike of Windows can't overcome my absolute inability to use this super flat 0.58 millimeter travel keyboard. And that's a hell of a thing to have to say wow. to someone who whose first the first computer I bought with my own money was a Macintosh. And I've been I'm a Mac user since that was the sort of thing that got you made fun of by everybody. And but I would still use. I would. I would take all the money that I was. I would take the money that I would spend. I would save uh, on uh, uh, on the MacBook by buying a, a ThinkPad and use it to buy a much much better desktop Mac instead. So I still have a desktop, but there's no way in hell I will be buying another Mac MacBook unless they fix the keyboard. It's just a deal breaker. Andy, I'm, I'm you make such a it. good point. You make such a good point in that the the. Key, the the butterfly keyboard is polarizing. People hate it, and that's a problem. It it doesn't right. matter. And, the and I don't think it's, I don't yeah, think it's like so. there's as many people love it as hate it. I think yeah. it's like there are a group of people who say it's not that bad, and then there's people who hate it. But there's no one right. that says, "Oh, I love this, I, this keyboard. is my favorite this is the best <laughs> keyboard ever." No one says yeah. says never. And that that's a problem, and that is absolutely true. That that from from day one, when it first came out, before we knew about the issues, people were saying. They hated the butterfly keyboard, and Apple didn't didn't fix that problem. And you can't have a keyboard on a Mac that people hate. You like yeah. you uh, you need it to be a keyboard that people don't care about. Like that yeah, that exactly. is the one yeah, you want. It, it shouldn't. Yeah, you shouldn't. It shouldn't have any. You shouldn't even know that it's there. Pretty much, it should just be something that you don't have to think about. If you can get that out of the way then that's even better because if you're focusing on that thing, then of course yeah. it calls it out. Uh, we do need to take a break, uh, but when we come back, we've got a lot more to talk about, including a certain producer slash, I don't know, what do you call those people? The beats people, the people that make music <laughs> that's just a bunch of beeps and boops. Uh, <laughs> one of them is using the new Mac Pro. Interesting. But first, this episode of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by IT Pro TV. Enjoy learning with IT Pro TV's edutainers who blend education and entertainment to make learning IT engaging and fun in an interactive talk show format. So you might be familiar with that kind of feel. Hopefully you've been a little bit fun and a little bit engaging today. So if you like that kind of thing, then you should check out IT Pro TV. Now it's a big month for Microsoft announcements. We covered the new uh, stuff that Microsoft announced. I think that was just last week. And there was a lot to go through. Uh, you can use IT Pro TV to get the certs you need to become a Microsoft professional. IT Pro TV has more than 800 hours of Microsoft training, including Microsoft Azure. Azure, of course, is a big part of, of Microsoft's offerings and sort of is the backbone of a lot of the different platforms that exist there. Uh, so if you want to learn more about that and become a better user of Azure and therefore a more valuable employee or even, you know, just to add it to your resume, then IT Pro TV is a great place to do that with more than 800 hours of training. IT Pro TV is so versatile, they can help you and your team get certified in IT training in all sectors, be it government, managed services, healthcare, education, tech, finance, insurance, and so much more. They are the official video training partner for CompTIA, and they have 12 CompTIA on-demand courses, including CompTIA A+, Network Plus, and Security Plus certs. You can become part of IT Pro TV's family with either a standard membership of video only or a premium membership, which includes both video and labs and practice tests. So you get the whole kit and caboodle there. You don't want to wait. You visit go.itpro.tv slash MacBreak and use the code MacBreak30 and you're going to get 30% off. Once again, that's go.itpro.tv slash MacBreak and use the code MacBreak30 for an additional 30% off for the lifetime of your active subscription. 
So the whole time you've got a subscription, you're getting the 30% off. That's quite the deal. IT Pro TV, build or expand your IT career and enjoy the journey. Thanks so much to IT Pro TV for sponsoring this week's episode of Mac Break Weekly. Let's talk about Calvin Harris. Yes, folks, that was the person I was referring to. The DJ is the the, the sherm. So thank you for those of you who who guessed it. The beeps and the boops. Uh, <laughs> Mr. DJ so, here. So you think of a person who DJs as just somebody who makes beeps and boops? <laughs> You know, no, no, he's not there, inviting there of, you to the party. There are a lot of unces saying. involved as well. Yeah, some unces. You're right. There are some unces. <laughs> there's some thoughts. There's yes, some yes, thought yes. that goes into yes. it. Uh, but <laughs> what is it that people? You know, they're they're really. Uh, it's the EDM. It's the beeps and the boops of the EDM. <laughs> as a yep, as a yep, former yep. rave jock, I, I take offense to the whole thing. I'm so sorry. Say, I just, Those of you out there who beep and boop, I know you're doing hard work. Wait, wait, um, wait. I think I think we need to address the fact that Alex just said that he's a former rave jockey. <laughs> what is a did you really have to do that? What is a rave? jockey wow. what is that uh, i i i used to do i used to spin at raves a long time <laughs> that's ago that's amazing like 30 years okay. ago okay 30 years ago i had i want my hair i want to see this in real life i don't oh man i'd have to i have to find my stuff but i had yeah you know, a couple mk 1200s and i had um you know just a lot of you had a mohawk is that what you were trying to say i did it was it didn't look like a mohawk it was it was my hair was long in the center and shaved on the side so it was that way but it was a little lower and the hair was a little longer so it didn't stick up or anything so so, so it was a so slightly is, different is, look does your hair follicle still hmm? test positive for ecstasy that's what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> how, how long does it take for that really completely flushes out of your system yeah, you know i just don't like take that. the jacket anywhere that's the key <laughs> of the operation so it's uh so anyway yeah it so but anyway it's a lot of work it's to do it well and i wasn't great at it i was like the opening guy the, <laughs> i was the guy that was there when there was like 100 people there not when there was 2000 you know so, or whatever so <laughs> Uh, so Calvin Harris is posting some photos on Instagram. Also, I resent the fact someone saying that I must not be a club goer. I love going <laughs> dancing. Thank you. I just forgot in the yeah. moment I needed Make to eat more almonds before the show started. So I said beeps and boops instead of DJ. Uh, I'm a robot. Just deal with it. Uh, so <laughs> Calvin Harris has been posting photo or Instagram stories of his studio and while he's working on his beeps and boops. And uh, <laughs> while that was going on, you can see a Mac Pro hanging out there. I in, doubt by accident. And it's got the wheels. It's got the wheels. <laughs> it's, got the, it's got the modern look. It is not the old <sighs> cheese grater. It is the new cheese grater. I think we need the cue. Oh, dream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. That thing looks amazing. Of course, this is the, the Mac Pro that starts from $5,999. It is a powerhouse machine. Uh, it is a power, power, powerhouse machine. <laughs> and folks are wanting to get their hands, their, their... And Apple will make, they'll sell as many as they can make at that price. Yeah. At the, probably at the $30,000 price, they're going to sell as many as they can make. So... Obviously, this is this is. Uh, I mean, I think yeah. There's there's no mistake here. This is clearly showing one uh, creative outlet for the use of a machine. Someone who needs this machine to power the stuff that they're doing. Um, but can we talk a little bit about what are some of the go to fields and go to use cases for this level of machine and why you need this versus an iMac Pro or a, as we've talked about the MacBook Pro that's not necessarily Pro. Who is using this besides uh, DJ Beep, Beep Boop Calvin Harris? <laughs> well, I, you know, for, for visual effects, uh, we use pretty heavy duty machines. You need a lot of RAM. You need possibly multiple GPUs. You need uh, tons of CPU power. And a lot of us have wanted to be able to rack mount them. We've wanted to be able to you know, add add new things, be able to continue to keep upgrading them if you're going to put that kind of money into it. Um, so the you need a lot of power. And a lot of people have been looking at, or people have been leaving the Mac platform specifically because we can build more powerful PCs mm -hmm. than we can uh, get with a Mac. It just got to a point where the trash can wasn't going to be enough to do anything. And that was like 10 days after the trash can was released. So... The, the fact that we now have something that is highly scalable, that is very powerful, that you know, a Apple, I think, did all the right things with this, um, this piece of hardware, which is that they're, they said, okay, we're not going to worry about making these. This is, this is not a consumer box. It right. is a, this is truly a Mac Pro. Mm -hmm. you know, and so they say Pro in this case, I don't think in all the cases that they say Pro, in, including the laptop. AirPods Pro? Is it Come really on. Pro? 
this is truly a pro device. Right. You know, and Apple was not constricted to if you know, and for folks who want something, they're like, well, they should make it cheaper. Well, there's an iMac Pro right. that has a lot of power. Mm -hmm. You know, like the the Mac, iMac Pro is very powerful. This is where that ends and there's a little overlap between it between the two in price yeah and then it goes up into the place where folks that i work with need it and yep. so if you're doing if you're going to be doing 8k video this is going to be the machine if you're going to be doing you know for for high-end uh you know visual effects this could be the next you know quote-unquote sgi and, and for those of you know when i was at at ilm at most people, except for me, I was in the Rebel Mac unit, <laughs> but um, <laughs> but the uh, almost everybody else had Octanes, you know, or or you know, or at least um, what was the little one? The, there was a, there was a little little version of the Octane o O2s um, that were on every desk, and these started at fifteen or sixteen thousand dollars, went to sixty hundred thousand dollars, and people that's what everybody had, wow, because that's what you needed to do this kind of work, and so. When you're talking about this high-end development work, um, when you're talking about scientific simulation, big math, big, you know, uh, there's lots of places where you need to crunch serious numbers and you're just not going to be able to do it. I have the, when we're talking about photogrammetry, I was shooting a bunch of photogrammetry. I built a, I built a model on my little iMac at home that has <laughs> 343 million polygons. And you know what? I, I can, I hit move and then I go have a coffee. When I come back, it is moved. <laughs> you know, like, like it is, I, I, I have taken this to the outer edge and it took, it took six days for that little iMac to create that model, yeah. you know, from the photographs, wow. 200, uh, 370 photographs. And so, so the, and that was the low res photographs. That wasn't like the full res photographs that it would have been much worse. And so for that kind of work, what I need is a Mac Pro. And the reason I have an iMac and not a Mac Pro is because I was waiting for a an actual Mac, Mac, Mac Pro. Mac Pro. Yeah. So, so the um, now I have a bigger PC that I'm using right now for the for the bigger work. So I have it's got it's got a Threadripper and uh, a couple big GPUs and a ton of RAM, and so that w works pretty well um, for that one operation. But I, you know, obviously I can't wait for a Mac Pro. And so there's a lot of people, and in Hollywood and a lot of other places, there's also going to be the cool factor. There are people who are going to get the monitor and the and the and, and they're not going to need it, <laughs> but it, it does matter. Like what you show up with, you know, in a production environment right. tells the client that I'm making good money because I'm good at this and I'm doing these things. It, it does matter what car you ride, drive. It does matter what, what computer you use. It does, like all of those things say stability and success, you know, and they communicate those to the client. If you've ever walked into an edit suite in Hollywood or, or anywhere else or a, or a color suite or an effect suite, everything is the best that they can get right because people are spending a thousand dollars an hour or two thousand dollars an hour to be sitting in there and so the the cost of the equipment is less important you want it to be shiny and, and really powerful and so anyway so apple even if you never put it in front of someone the fact that it's rack mountable the fact that it's totally extensible it is uh, an amazing machine so it's it, i'm i'm uh, and I'm, I'm glad a lot of us love the cheese grater i'm, I'm glad we just got enough i i'm totally happy with the updated trees, cheese cheese grater i want to quickly compare so the the display this this uh super professional that's Pat actually Pro really display. cost effective by the way that's what i was about to ask so let's <laughs> oh, compare man. what it does to a similar monitor that's available right now two or three times more that's okay yeah like like it, it is an incredible value what that what this display is providing is a great value and i think I think that the the idea behind the stand made a lot of sense, which is that we're going to let our designers make the best stand that's going to make this thing feel like it's floating. And if you don't want that, we're going to give you a way to, we're going to make it easy for you to just go ahead. We're not going to make you pay for that, for the stand, because a lot of people put them on walls or they have their own way that they want to mount them. I think that the stand, you know, I is a great stand. I don't know if I would get the stand. I think I would probably buy a third party that gives me more, actually more, an ability to move the monitor more than what that stand's going to let me do. Mm -hmm. But I love the fact that Apple let their engineers go. And, and I think that in general, I think that just like a, a Ferrari or, or other folks let their engineers, you know, have an F1 you know, version of what they're doing. It allows them to press the outer envelope of what they're doing and lets the engineers run wild. And I think that this, this piece of hardware lets the engineers run wild. I think it'll it's it's a it'll affect things down the road uh, with the entire line, um, but it lets people who can afford it, you know, pay for the the thought process. 
Excellent. Uh, that that was kind of my my curiosity going into as we get closer to this machine and and uh, we see folks using it sort of. Uh, and who, as who this made sense. And my only thing that's missing for me is that it won't have Nvidia cards. <laughs> I'm not a not an ATI fan. Uh, any other thoughts on the Mac Pro? I genuinely so, have nothing to add because it's not a machine what, for me, and that's fine. What I was yep. just thinking though is, could I get? I mean, you know, obviously money is a factor, but like, what about the XDR, the Pro XDR display and the MacBook Pro, the brand new MacBook Pro? Is that ridiculous? It, it'd be a, <laughs> it'd be a little ridiculous. I mean, you know, like it would be, you know, like if you want a big monitor, I mean, it's a really expensive monitor to do that. It is going to give you a very, very accurate display. So I think that there are reasons for you to do that. There's other accurate monitors, but if you really need color accurate monitor, that is going to be spot on and full, you know, not full gamut, but very close to full gamut. Um, you are, uh, I think that that's going to be a great display for you. And I think that there are people that are going to get that monitor. I think you're right. Maybe there photographers people, or something. Photographers, people who are doing still editing, but they're not using the Mac Pro. They're using something smaller, like a MacBook Pro that, that they're going to um, plug into it. So, so I do think that there is um, a reason that uh, people will use uh, you know, get the monitor just for their laptop. So it's not out of the, it's not something I would jump to immediately, but I think that uh, it definitely, it will make sense for folks. And I think they were showing super high res with code. Yeah, they're showing code. You know, if you're, if you're, uh, you know so that, that could be another reason. I guess you're it. a high paid coder. And, a lot or, of real estate there. <laughs> or you're, and, and this is not, this is not minor. So when you're looking at code like this, being able to see more you know, more lines lets you, especially as you're trying to figure out what's wrong or what's missing or, or how mm -hmm. this relates to something else, it's not necessarily trivial that you can, you know, that you can see more of it at one time. Right. But you can do that with other less expensive. Yeah, you can, <laughs> you can spend $700 on. Yeah, I don't think I would that. buy it for that. <laughs> but to, again, to do that. If yeah, you're, yeah. maybe if you're the, oh, and see, here's, we we're talking about, um, what is it? X uh -huh. XDRs. I forget now. It's the, it's the AR package that you were talking about earlier. Well, USDZ. Well, this is, yeah, this lets you play, throw the monitor anywhere so you can see what it would look like in your office. Yeah. And then that's how they get mm -hmm. you. Um, <laughs> so that's, I'm not going to lie. I, I actually think it would be really fun to have that monitor, even though it's absolutely unnecessary in my household. <laughs> yeah. Throw, throw, throw it on top of your Ikea desktop with your, yeah. <laughs> with the desk, exactly. with the chair that you stole from, from Staples <laughs> with the last yeah, job. Yeah, exactly. Usually if you're, if you're doing serious color work. You know, mission critical. Which I don't. You're getting don't paid course. for it's color fun. work, whether it's video or, or photos. This monitor is the best best buy out there. If you are not doing that, it's a waste of money. So I do, uh, Alex, and some other folks I think do suffer from uh, seasonal depression. And most of the time, you buy a third. You just buy a light <laughs> that does that. You could do this, but you could buy this display, use it on the regular. Yeah. It's got a thousand uh, nits of brightness. Normally, it's twelve hundred nits peak. So I can do my little uh, treat my seasonal depression treatments with this display. So let's see yeah. if I can get my insurance. To Micah, cover it. I, I Exactly. I'm, I'm yeah. saying that it's, I, I want to be on your insurance plan if it's covered. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you know. I'll follow up with that. Uh, Lori, you were about to say something. Um, I was so distracted by how much fun we're having. Oh, um, Alex, <laughs> maybe you can remind me of this. When, when Apple first announced the display, there was a conversation about the brightness and color accuracy that in other monitors – at that peak that that the XDR display gets, it would actually shut down other monitors or something like that. Do you know? Do you remember what I'm talking about with that? I don't. Um, I think that the problem that you end up with with other monitors is is and this one will still you still have to be careful with this. I think I'm not sure, but I think that you have to be careful in general, which is that a lot of them a lot of them peak at a thousand nits. This one peaks at sixteen hundred nits. And so the sustained brightness being at a thousand nits is 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 a lot more than what you normally get. So most of the monitors are peaking at a thousand nits. And to put it in perspective, the the full gamut for uh, HDR, I'm not going to get into the details of this, but the full gamut is ten thousand. The, the 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 brightest I've seen is uh, four thousand, uh, and one thousand is pretty uh, pretty common for an HDR uh, display. But it's usually peaks at 1,000, and you you can't keep it there because it'll shorten the life of the monitor. Um, so having a peak at at 1,600 and saying that it can withstand 1,000 is it's a lot of brightness. Yeah, and there's a little asterisk that takes you to the bottom of the page. It will peak at 1,600 nits of brightness uh, in temperatures less than 25 degrees Celsius, which is 77 degrees Fahrenheit. So as long as it can get, as long as it's maintaining that low. 
uh, lower temperature. Then you should not be working over 77 degrees for the <laughs> electronics, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. And it's mostly, it's as they say, more air than metal. So literally. they've got this whole cooling system. It's literally in my, when, when, as we were doing productions, it's literally in our rider. The maximum temperature is 75 degrees. Really? Degree. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, like, you know, cool. like, because it's just nice. not good for the equipment. Right. You know, and so I, that's what I say anyway. Well, it's, it's not good like for working. the M&Ms that you like to have. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You don't want those melting. Yeah. Without brown. Yeah. Yeah. Without the brown M&Ms uh, <laughs> that nobody likes. Uh, now, Apple is <laughs> is going to be working on, uh, there, was a, there was a bug with encryption uh, for email. And apparently it was caused by Siri, which is interesting. Uh, this this bug is something that Apple is working on. But in the meantime, there have been some uh, workarounds uh, implemented. I do, I've not had this issue personally. I don't use um, the built-in mail app for iOS. Uh, I'm curious if you folks, as iOS users, regular iOS users and macOS users, Raise your hand if you, well, you don't have to raise your hand. Just let me know. Do you <laughs> use the built-in default apps for mail? Lori Gill. I do on my Mac, not on my iPhone. Um, the, the, I, because of what I do for a living, I have to remember that um, there's built-in apps that, that we have to deal with and look at and learn how to use so that we can tell other people how to use them. So on my Mac, I still have the, I'm using the built-in app. Um, I believe the issue that, if I'm not mistaken, it has to do with encrypting a message. Um, so if you're trying to encrypt a message, the Siri um, suggestion will accidentally save that text unencrypted. Um, so it's it seems like a very um, limited issue, but also really a big deal because people who need to encrypt their emails they encrypt it for a reason and having it unencrypted is is such a dangerous thing for for what they're trying to to achieve which is complete privacy um so it it it's good to see that that apple is acknowledging this and they're working on taking care of this but it certainly is something that um it's a, it's a little jarring to know that something that is intended to be this absolute secure way of transmitting an email has actually left a little cookie behind that's, you know, easy, not, not hard for, you know, the little mouse to come pick up the crumbs from <laughs> if, if they wanted to. Yeah. Essentially you, you want to be able to ask Siri for, well, some people do want to be able to ask Siri for uh, references to emails that you may have sent. And so as Siri is going through and saving this information, be it an email in this case, it's storing it in something called, I believe the, the file is called snippets.db. And when it's stored there, it's unencrypted, despite the fact that in your email, it is encrypted. So Siri, in order to see it, is storing it in a place that is unencrypted. So that just goes against. Uh, there are some suggestions for what to do in this 9 to 5 Mac article. There's one that I just do anyway. Uh, you turn on file vault uh, for folks who don't know that's in system preferences security and privacy and then file vault that encrypts your drive uh, and then you can also turn off Siri suggestions for particular apps and so you can turn those off for mail and then Siri won't save those in snippets.db because you don't have Siri suggestions turned on for that I don't find myself using Siri on the Mac ever 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 um, that's true and, I don't either. Yeah, and so I should probably just turn these features off in general. I've, I've kept them on just in case I wanted to use Siri <laughs> on the Mac, but I've genuinely <laughs> never, except when I wanted to see, oh, they say that Siri can do this on the Mac to run right. a test. But other than that, I don't really yeah. use it on the Mac. which is It seems awkward, doesn't it? Yeah. You should, I, I know there's a lot of people for whom voice activation and, and even, you know, the assistance of Siri on a Mac is a great idea, but I have not yet found a good reason to use it on a Mac. Yeah. I, I wish that there was a, that there was a way to input via text to speak to Siri on the Mac, because the number of times where I just want an answer to the question and I want something a little bit more powerful than, uh, than doing, using the search bar, uh, just the ability to say, schedule an appointment for this time this place or what's this time's the, 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 I, I, I'm, I can think of hopefully things that you can't just do with the search <laughs> bar but there there it's very very awkward for me to like speak to my computer when I've got my hands on a keyboard my thumbs on a trackpad uh, and also I probably also already have my phone like nearby anyway and so if I really want a voice assistant I'm probably going to be able to use it through the phone anyway so it's a it's a it's a weird implementation. I think. 
I have I use the the mail app, but I I also view pretty much any electronic communication as unsecure. Mm-hmm. I, 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 so, so I, you know, I don't, I, I don't like the idea of encrypting emails specifically because I don't want to think about them that way, you know? So, you know, so I don't want to, I don't think about, like, I don't think of, I don't post private stuff on Twitter. Like I don't have a lot of private conversations that I, uh, mm-hmm. or, or, or anything DMs else or anything, in my DMs right? or yeah. anywhere, because I'm just like, I don't, <laughs> and I don't do like friends that I only share with on any social platform. If I'm going to do social platforms, it's all public. Mm-hmm. Like it's never private. And it's not because it's just because I don't want to think about it that way. I don't want to create, I, I remember when Path came out, I started sharing pictures of my kids because it was only a handful of people. And then I was like, I'm not going to do this. You know, like I just, yeah. and, and that was when I changed my thought process mm-hmm. away from that. Now, if I have things that are semi-complicated, but not uh, secure conversations or stuff that you have in a, with trusted friends, Face to face, like that is the like that is that is how you have secure secure the semi secure is something like Signal, you know, and and that is as 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 unsecure as I'm gonna you know get with anything. Right. If I'm really worried about something where my where I'm talking about real secrets or whatever, I'm not gonna use any of those communication things. I you know so semi secure is like a a safe phone call and a you know that I'm relatively trust in a trustworthy place to a trustworthy person or in person uh, you know or, or signal those are the two like that I consider semi safe mm-hmm. um, but I would still never put anything in there that I would worry about anybody seeing because right. you just can't you can't trust uh, you you shouldn't I, I don't know I I my opinion is you shouldn't trust any of these uh, you it's not safe is that specific <laughs> to communication. Um, services or like uh, do you not have like a password protection or a password manager because you uh, worry about the um so i do know, you know I, I, your password manager getting access or is so it just the communications it's just stuff? The communications i actually use okay, yeah. LastPass because of i don't like typing um i don't like typing my passwords in unless i have to same same mm-hmm. reason mm-hmm. you know like i don't want mm-hmm. it's yeah, oh, you're yeah, actually yeah, yeah. you're, you're yeah. less secure typing those passwords in than mm-hmm. you are uh, having LastPass automatically fill them. So there's mm-hmm. a, yeah. you know, my, both my phone and LastPass ha- have cripplingly long uh, passwords, you know, and, <laughs> and so, um, and I won't give them to anybody, won't even breathe them, you know, like it's not, uh, so, but I, I still know that there's a chance that, that those things could, could happen there. But I, I do use a password protector mostly so that I can, um, not be typing them in, especially if I'm on a plane or in a public place. I don't want to be mm. typing them in. Yeah. And then I generally try to operate in, inside of VPNs. You know, so when I'm not, I don't, if I'm, I don't mind jumping on to Wi-Fi, but I want to have my communication um, then tied down uh, pretty quickly. This is actually the perfect time uh, for us to take another break. Speaking of LastPass, they're actually bringing us this episode. Oh, good now, segue. Alex didn't know I did that. Not know. I just want to point out for the record. I yeah, no Alex idea. didn't know that. But surprise, <laughs> LastPass is bringing you this episode of MacBreak Weekly. Uh, it, of course, is an award-winning security solution that has helped millions of individuals and over 43,000 organizations navigate their online lives easily and securely. Let's be honest, you're probably accessing different password-protected accounts all over the place from your smartphone, your smartwatch, your laptop. With the LastPass mobile app, you can continue to have the safety and security of logging in anytime, anywhere, and you still only need that one master password. Your LastPass account is backed up and synced across all devices for access to your passwords no matter where you are. All you do is download LastPass's password manager from the App Store on your device and log in with the same LastPass account to sync your data. The autofill on mobile device removes the hassle of typing on small mobile keyboards and also, as Alex pointed out, is more secure so you're not in public typing in those passwords, particularly if you're not a typist and you are sort of hunting and pecking at keys. Someone sees that and uh, gets gets access to that. Can I say one thing about of that? course, yeah. One of the things that's really important about LastPass and why we really got into this is uh, that you can share passwords with other people and in your organization that they don't see the password. So a lot of times we were working with a lot of external accounts that you, you know, and so we want to minimize the number of people that touch that password. Mm-hmm. So you can set up a password, uh, you can set it up in LastPass, then you put it in a folder, but you're locking down that password. So they can log into that account mm-hmm. if they have to, but they don't actually know what the password is because, you know, giving away passwords is not just the fact that um, uh, you're giving someone a, something to type, but you're also creating, you're showing possible patterns of how you do, right. how you do your passwords. And yeah. so, so the, um, so it's important to share that as few times as possible. And we used it, yeah, across the company. 
that's yeah. I, I hadn't I hadn't considered the the ability to be able to share without sharing. That's really nice. Uh, of course. In fact, we do use uh, LastPass Enterprise here at Twit. Uh, everybody who needs to have access to our different Wi-Fi accounts and uh, the other accounts that we use, we can all easily log into that, get access to that. And there's even secure notes and things like that if you need to keep that data more secure. Uh, of course, LastPass is set up so that you can use your authentica authentication methods that you already have. So your fingerprint, your uh, face ID, and that gives you access to your passwords with after you've typed in your master password, uh, a little bit more convenience there. So again, having LastPass available to where I'm not having to run to IT uh, or, or a specific person and go, now what is the password for that Amazon thing again? And then suddenly it's being shouted out loud or it's being shared over uh, post-it notes, for goodness sake. None of that. This helps keep everything secure if you're working with a team or even as an individual. LastPass also has an expanded business lineup with some amazing features that will improve security across your company and make life easier for your users. Make it easier for them, which makes it easier for you. If you visit lastpass.com slash twit, you're going to find out how they can help you. Lastpass.com slash twit is where you want to head. There's our pal Leo talking about LastPass. We do enjoy it here at Twit. And uh, I know many of our listeners are LastPass users and LastPass lovers. Uh, it's been great for convenience, but added security. And uh, giving it to your family, making sure that they're keeping their stuff secure is uh, also a great little, little gift and a tip for the holiday season. While you're home, tell your family about LastPass. Help them get it all set up. And then, of course, uh, when, when they need it, you can be there to help them uh, from afar. All right, let's go ahead and move on to, this is exciting. Uh, I'm, I'm personally excited about this because I've been using this. This will probably make Alex Lindsay kind of uh, shiver a little bit, but I really like the, uh, the health records feature in the health app for iOS. Basically, uh, I can go into the health app and I can say, okay, now here in California, I'm part of the Kaiser Permanente doctor stuff, <laughs> the health <laughs> stuff. It was a little bit different where I came from, where the insurance and the uh, actual doctor that I went to were separate things. So this is a little weird where the whole system's one thing here. Um, anyway, aside from that, I can log in with my account credentials and the health app is able to pull down my information. So when I go in and I get my blood pe pressure measured, to get my uh, height and weight measured and temperature and all those different things, all of those panels and tests and whatever, uh, that information is stored with me on my device and I am able to then keep track of it and add it to my health data. Uh, so I've been using health records for quite a while. In fact, when I first came to Twit, I one of the first things I did was after I got set up with Kaiser Permanente was I went on and saw that Kaiser Permanente was not an option for integration. And I was like, I thought this was California. I thought we were just <laughs> north of Silicon Valley. What's going on? Uh, but they recently added staying, staying here longer, you realize that we can't even keep the power on. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> By golly. Uh, so that was an exciting thing for me. But uh, Apple and the U.S. Department of Veterans have announced that veterans can now access their health records on their iPhone via Apple's health app. By the way, I, I think I actually think this is great. Oh, I, I think that your your phone is probably the most secure place that your medical records are. <laughs> that's no, that's a good point. break it to you all. Yeah, you know, like that's it's fair. So it's, there's a lot of people touching medical records, and there's a lot of access to them. And I think that Apple has gone through an enormous amount of trouble to secure this. And I think this is where Apple's uh, work on privacy has is paying off, where they can take on these kinds of things, and people might actually want to use them. I think that the, the uh, Doing it with veterans, I, mean, I, I think doing it for veterans, and obviously the announcement near Veterans Day is is a is a great thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I think that that's that's great. I think it also is easier for them to do because it's a large na national unified solution. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Medicare somewhere down the path, or yeah. you know, like because it's just we get to do all of it at one time, you know, rather than the piecemeal. And so it lets you kind of work on it and show the tr build trust before, and and it'll help bring in more and more health. Healthcare providers, I think. 
It says more than 400 health systems have signed on. Uh, yeah, that list is getting long if you go in and click the little add button mm -hmm. to try and add your system uh, to find yours. It, it does surface the the ones that are closest to you. It asks for your location uh, to let you get plugged in. But yeah, this is, is partnered with the, or worked with the, the Department of Veteran Affairs. And uh, it, it's a great way too for doctors to for, for a, a patient to sort of work a little bit closer with their doctor where a lot of times you know your doctor might say oh yeah here's a info sheet and it's this giant eight and a half by 11 page uh and there's this little link on it and it's a long link instead of uh, bitly or something like that it's not shortened and <laughs> you go there to this online web portal and you can keep track of this and that and find out how all these integrations need to be plugged in and that gets a little confusing a little complicated and so this feature where oh, it's suddenly on my phone, I can see now that my lab panels have come through and I get a notification on my phone, hey, you've got some new records available. You can go in right there and see. And the cool thing is uh, the health app, it integrates with the national uh, health systems and, and the databases for different uh, tests. And so it has, you know, sort of the standard deviation and the, the average for tests that are healthy. And so you can see where your your blood panel might be in or outside of those tests. Uh, it works with prescription medications as well and gives you more information about those. It's got a lot of information in there and I found it helpful for myself. And so I'm glad that the VA is also uh, adding this on. And I hope that, you know, folks are given proper tutorials for how to take advantage of it, because I think that it can be helpful uh, if, if they are. I think that we're going to keep moving slowly as I think Apple's doing the same thing they're doing with AR, <laughs> which is that we're right. slowly <laughs> adding, you know, parts of this puzzle in, into the, into the process. But I think that this is a super important thing for Apple to do, but I think we're going to start seeing also right now, we're not keeping track of all of our data from our watch. Isn't all going into, into this, you know, currently, but I think that as we build trust and as we do those things, we're going to start seeing a point where we are, tracking all of our health data and more and more of our health data um, where we're able to provide our doctors with more. Um, and, and we're going to start seeing things. I think that when we anonymize all this data, so mm -hmm. differential, um, you know, uh, differential privacy, privacy, yeah. being able to, number one is we're going to start seeing patterns, you know, so if, if you start tying, and I don't think Apple's going to do this anytime soon. So before everyone starts putting on their foil hats, but <laughs> there is some point where we start tying our DNA records to our, the, the, um, uh, the data and, uh, and it can be anonymized. Uh, but the idea is we're going to start to be able to see trends. Okay. So I see you having this happening with your heart or this, this rest resting heart rate. Mm -hmm. We're gonna see things that we never saw before ever, you know, like, like there's going to be things that we see that are happening with your body that, we now know are a precursor to something really bad happening in six months or three months or two mm -hmm. weeks or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we're able to say, you should probably go in for a doctor's appointment. Can I schedule that for you? You know, you know, you know and, and so I, I think, and I think that's a decade away. You know, I don't think that, you know, there's a lot of things that we have to do between now and then, and there's gonna be more features, but I think that, I think this is definitely Apple kind of creeping up that, that path. Absolutely. Uh, there was, I I'm, I'm need to go back and look for it, uh, but I recently, interviewed uh, someone on triangulation about this specific topic. And one of the issues with, one of the issues that we as humans have is that we want to have explanations for every, every pattern, every, uh, everything, every answer that comes from from a given uh, process, and sometimes there just aren't answers. Uh, so David Weinberger uh, wrote this book called Everyday Chaos, and it's uh, technology, complexity, and how we're thriving in a new world of possibility. And so in this conversation, or in this book, uh, he talks about how AI uh, and big data are way more complex and unpredictable than we realize, and then we kind of like allow ourselves to realize. And it's like that Pocahontas quote, uh, how can there be so much that you don't know you don't know? We really don't know how uh, powerful this stuff is, but instead of giving over to that chaos, that everyday chaos, we want to sort of hold back and say, mm, I need to know why that does that or why that doesn't do that. So he talks about A-B testing. He talks about all these things. But the big thing is, it's, it starts with a conversation about how there are right now essentially like a big black box that you can take someone's whole history of their health and put it into this big black box and then out the other end spits this little thing that says, hey, you might want to get tested for this. Hey, you might want to change this about your diet. Hey, you might want to do this. 
And right now we see that information and we want to go, now, how did you come to that? But to be able to understand that our minds need to be that big black box of AI computing that's looking at all of those data points simultaneously. And if we can let ourselves sort of look past that and just um, accept that some things are things we can't explain, but that that data is there, that's kind of what the conversation was about in the book. But I found it interesting in terms of, yeah, when we start tracking all of this data and find a place to put it that we feel safe with it, um, then we can... In, catch things early on. I think of it in the same way that I think of uh, you know, what my life was like before Yelp. You know, like I don't <laughs> know where to go eat. You know, like and, and now my my whole like I went to India and there was no like there was no Yelp working in the cities that I was in, and I was like, how am I supposed to do what this? Do I like, eat? you know, now I'm now I'm just gonna have to walk around and find someplace. You know, like this is this is crazy. You know, and so the but I think that that we're, we've gotten used to a lot of other parts of our life that are highly. Uh, organized because of kind of a group data mm -hmm. that has been added for better and for worse, mm -hmm. you know, but, but I think that, um, you know, there's going to be a lot around health that's going to benefit us um, in the future. Yeah. Do you folks use uh, Apple's or do you do any health tracking, activity tracking, anything like that with your Apple watches or other wearables? Andy, not to not to the extent, but I don't make I don't make full use of the features of the Apple Watch uh, and big B. I, although I've been wearing it practically daily since I got it a few months ago, uh, it's mostly it's just to keeping an eye on my level of activity throughout the day. But yeah, what, what Alex is saying is absolutely true. It's uh, there there are things you can't there the the things that happen when you start collecting data about yourself, even if it's just simply a spreadsheet that you're just making a tick mark saying today I felt good, today I felt not so good and then once you get in the habit of just that binary good not so good if you've been if you create that habit you add like maybe one more column like every month like did i get do i feel like i got a lot of sleep today i know i did yes or no did i feel like i ate well today yes or no do i feel like i was act really active today yes or no that and once it's it's not something that's useful after about a month it's something that's useful after a year or two when you suddenly realize that oh look how there seems to be a pattern here that that uh, that time where i was eating i i it was thanks Thanksgiving, I had lots and lots of sugar. I was not only did I like not feel like I was very active. Not only was I not very active for the next two or three days, but I was also I, I also described myself as being in a down or grumpy mood for three days after that. Perhaps there's a correlation there. Uh, the I will say cynically, however, that this would be a great technology for every country other than the United States of America, because you the biggest feature of such a data collection and analysis program is going to have to be making sure that there that it is legally not possible for an insurance company to screw you based on the fact mm -hmm. that you allowed you allowed information about yourself to be tracked because as as it is the idea of uh, the the very last thing that i would allow uh, an insur a potential insurer or an insurer to have is access to my genetic records uh, or i don't even want them to know like what did my parents die of what did my grandparents die of because uh, i've uh, we we live in a kind of like a healthcare hell uh, in the United States, Every, everyone who's listening from outside the United States, everything you heard is absolutely true. If you are, if you are in that, if you are in that bracket of people that happen to have good corp, good healthcare because you're part of a large company that made sure that you have good healthcare and didn't skimp on it, that's great. Otherwise, you know that even if you are covered by insurance. There's going to be a good chance that this company is going to fight you on every single transaction that they have promised to give you. And if you don't have insurance, that they're going to fight to make sure that they're not going to take you unless you have uh, really uh, unless you have a, 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 the the equivalent of like an 800, 800 credit score for health, meaning that all <laughs> of your all of your family have, have died of no uh, of natural causes, no age younger than 100. Uh, and you don't drive a car. You don't <laughs> you don't do anything. It's it's. I, I've been through this where it's just uh, absolutely impossible to get treated as though you uh, you deserve to have health care because you're a human being who has had very good luck up to now. But God forbid you step off a curb at the wrong time or God forbid there is an embolism that's been waiting for a really uh, amusing time to burst on you. So I really feel as though data data is the is your most important tool 
as an individual who wants to stay healthy and wants to get adequate uh, adequate uh, diagnoses, it is your absolute enemy when it comes to dealing with the American healthcare industry. So uh, once once we have like European style uh, uh, protections in place, and we have to realize that uh, the times where Google has been nailed to the wall for collecting healthcare information improperly, it's been the EU. It has not been the United States who has done that. Uh, once those protections are in place, that's when these beautiful things can start to happen, but pretty, pretty much not before. Uh, well put. Now, Lori, what about you? Are you a activity tracker health app user? So I've, I've, uh, Micah, you and I have, have known each other since, since the day health, the uh, uh, health records was available in the right. health app. And I, I was just kind of, eh, well, you know, it's not available around here. And I don't know, I'm not that worried about it. Just now, when you were talking about it and you you mentioned that more organizations um, are now using it, mm -hmm. I just popped into the health app and literally while we were talking, I added my um, my insurance account to the, to the health records. And I actually found the information kind of fascinating. Nice. Um, it has um, all of the appointments that I've had dating back at least a year. Um, it just has that basic information, my blood pressure, my weight, my... Um, you know, all my t did I say my temperature? Like things like that. It's all right. just in there. Um, and for me, I I look at this stuff and I don't see anything I need to know. I also don't see anything that that um, from my perspective is important to track. But knowing that it's there, I feel that I now have I'm more empowered to um, use my health um, information where I need to and where mm -hmm. I want to instead mm -hmm. of having to rely on the doctor's office to provide that to me. It's my health data and and yeah. they they are the ones that are keeping track of it, which, you know, for, for our privacy and security, that's fine. But I also am um, beholden to them when they're the ones in charge of it. And I feel now that it's sitting here on my phone, mm -hmm. I actually feel more in charge of my health data right now. Just, just, having done that in the couple of minutes since you started talking about it. So it's well, interesting. And and you know, this is going to make a bigger difference also when we start moving to more and more virtual medicine, which is what we're seeing Amazon yeah. experimenting with um, a lot. Uh, and that probably mm. should terrify every insurance company <laughs> out there. <laughs> that, that, that uh, you know, the, the, the man who says your margin is my opportunity. Uh, there's a lot of margin that is his opportunity. So, um, so we're seeing some experimentation that, that Amazon's doing with virtual medicine and a lot of other folks are doing as well. But this kind of getting this all on your iPhone, getting it portable, getting it something that you can send and share with the people that you trust mm -hmm. uh, to do that is going to be something that's going to become more and more important as we move down that path. Absolutely. Uh, let's see. We have got to talk about this story. There was a there was a series of tweets. Uh, I think we now call that a thread. It was at one point called a tweet storm um, <laughs> about Apple Card. Uh, and now, so so uh, there was there was a there was a series of tweets that went out, and it was about um, DHH, who is the what is it co creator or no, the creator of Ruby on Rails. Um, he signed up for the Apple card and his wife signed up for the Apple card. And when he signed up for the Apple card, he had a giganto credit limit and he and his wife file their tax return together. There are all these things that point to them both being ranked by algorithms exactly the same. Uh, their, her credit score was higher than his even and all of these things that pointed to when she signed up, you would think that she would have the same credit limit. For some reason, she had a much smaller credit limit, uh, much, much, much smaller credit limit. And also there was another, there was another bit of a, of a barrier added on her account where say she spent $30 somewhere with her Apple card. If she were to go and pay that $30, uh, on her card, she wouldn't actually gain access to that credit limit addition until the next statement came through. So all these barriers were being put on her account for some reason, and he wasn't sure why, and she wasn't sure why. And so they reached out to at both Apple support, and then it seems like they, they spoke to Goldman Sachs. And uh, DHH, that's at DHH on Twitter, was, uh, you know, sort of talking about how this all went down and what every step of this was. And 
while this was going on, while the complaints were being made, then suddenly her uh, credit limit jumped to the same one that he had. Hmm. And there was no clear communication about why the credit limit had changed. Uh, when they spoke to some support teams, the support team said, look, we don't know. It's a black box. It's the algorithms determine things. And we're not sure why you originally didn't have that credit limit and you do now. And so he said, speaking to both Apple and Goldman Sachs, the people that they were able to talk to, no one knew why the the system had had done it differently and the there was an original claim you know from from dhh that this was uh an example of bias in ai and artificial intelligence that led to a sexist decision that resulted in him having a higher credit limit than his wife because he was trying to find other ways to show or to, to, to come across some other means to show why she would have a lower credit limit, despite the fact that she had a higher credit score. Um, the only other point that I want to add before we break into the discussion here is that uh, the New York's there's a New York organization that's in charge of making sure that New York's laws, financial laws are followed. Um, and I wish I could remember the name of the, the department, but basically they are looking into, they're doing a Goldman Sachs probe now to determine if laws were broken uh, because in New York, it is illegal to discriminate uh, against someone uh, f financially based on their sex. And I, I assume that that's the, the case in, in many places, but I can't speak for some states, who knows? Uh, so yeah, that, that all has been going on and... Uh, DHH now has sort of uh, been out in the open about this. And Steve Wozniak even got involved and said that he and his wife yeah. had the same thing uh, where he had a higher rating or had more money than she did. So let's talk about this. So I don't, I, I don't know a lot about it. In fact, I've spent most of my life with a lower, uh, lower credit limit than my wife. So, <laughs> so um, you know, she's, she's, she's much better about those things than I am. Um, so, but I did consult with some folks that, know a little bit more than I do about this. And one of the things that they said is what we don't know, and they're not saying that it's right. And they said they should absolutely look at the algorithm. They should mm -hmm. absolutely look at before we start, but we start, before we start running around with torches, mm -hmm. the, what they brought up was what we don't know about that is number one is the credit score is not the only thing. So your credit score is not the only thing they use that the algorithm uses to calculate it. There is credit utilization. So there's the, mm -hmm. how much of your credit are you using and how much is, uh, you know, and, and it's also credit utilization history across a long period of time, it can be looking at, at those things. What was your, what has your credit limit been for the last decade or the last seven years or whatever? So, or last, you know, so there's a, there's a running average of that, of that process. Also who applied first? If you have, if you have joint, you know, joint financials, mm -hmm. one person getting a lot of credit can affect the other person, um, the other person's ability to do the same thing. So they're, 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 they're not saying that that it is um, that there could be something very wrong with the algorithm. They said it's it's le it's not probably something that is vicious. It's probably something that is just an odd. You know, it's it's just picked up some something that it's that it's not doing correctly, um, and they can you know it'll get it'll get fixed. It's something that needs to be addressed and needs mm -hmm. to be looked at. But there are other factors, at least that I'm told. And again, I'm not the expert on this area, but I'm told that there are, there are other factors in that calculation that are probably creating the errata that people are seeing. And it's probably not errata that's occurring for everyone. Mm -hmm. It's probably, there's a handful of things that are happening that cause the algorithm to flip and they're definitely going to look at it and, um, and they definitely should, but it's not, it's probably not someone in there trying to make it one way or the other or having any opinion about it. It's a, it's an algorithm that's just looking at a bunch of numbers. Yeah. And I wanted to, to point out that DHH even says in the series of tweets I am not under the assumption that there's some nefarious human being out there uh, making this sexist decision. He was bringing the, uh, you know, the seemingly sexist decision to light. He was bringing it to light and saying, look, this is what's going on and nobody's able to answer the question. And, and that's where the problem that, exists. Yeah, that, the, the thing that the person that I talked to is, or the, the folks that I referred to is, is that the, the number one thing is you have to have people who can answer the phone that can solve the problem. Mm -hmm. Like that, that, that it's not, it, it's not that the algorithm is going to be perfect. It's just that you can't, put people in a circle when they can't figure it out. When something's obviously wrong, there has to be someone that you can get to make that decision and fix that decision. Um, and, and there's just always gonna be error corrections in this process. I mean, and, mm -hmm. and, and if you call, I mean, I've called credit cards and just gotten them to give me, you know, another 5,000 or 10,000 right. like arguing with them about it and then they pop it up. So, you know, their algorithm said one thing and then you talk to them and you someone, a human looks at it and then they make an adjustment. 
Yeah, this is this is this is the sort of stuff that I was afraid of when Apple announced that they were launching this credit card with Goldman Sachs. That uh, there's the 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 credit industry is not known for <laughs> good customer service. They're not known for really good customer outcomes. And every time that there's a there's a screw up like this, whether it's uh, intentional sexism, whether it's a black box algorithm that they have to unwind and figure out why it's doing that, or as Alex says. There's a lot of whiffle dust that goes into the decision of how much credit to offer somebody. Apple still gets that stink on them, and it's not they and they can't parry it off on Goldman Sachs. It they just because they decided to have to get in bed with this this company that wanted desperately to get into the credit credit business, or excuse me, the the, the consumer credit card business. Uh, and this is the same company that uh, two years ago got fined five billion dollars for their part in the housing lending crisis of actually deceiving investors uh, about the the value of these notes that they were uh, that they were. Putting out to people, so uh, I, I, I continue to wonder why Apple feels it really necessary to be in this business to begin with. Uh, I there must be a hell of a lot of money involved because there is so much PR downside. They they can't they can't uh, they can't absolve themselves and saying oh well we 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 designed that that really wonderful titanium card and we're the guys <laughs> who uh, who put together the app we're the people who put together the app we're not responsible for actual credit approval we're not responsible for collection agencies going after people uh, they again they are it's it is the Motorola rocker of financial instruments for them where they can't say that uh, that there's just terrible product that they don't that uh, does things that they wish didn't do but they were involved in it they decided to put their name on it and they are in bed with these people they have to deal with it and one thing too is that uh you know again dhh is talking uh has been making responses uh based on what people have said and one of the things is that you know people are like why are you so upset about this? This is common everyday banking practice. And that is what he's saying is that's the thing I take issue with is the fact that, yeah. that y yes, this might be depending on your, sp your particular situation or whatever it happens to be. But he's saying that's not cool, particularly because, as you note, Andy, Apple is saying, oh, we've made a different card. It's different from other credit cards. It's different from this. Um, th so, uh, Goldman Sachs has put out a, a statement, uh, and according to the statement, it says, we have not and never will make decisions based on factors like gender. In fact, we do not know your gender or marital status during the Apple Card application process. We are committed to ensuring our credit decision process is fair. Together with a third party, we have reviewed our credit decision process to guard against unintended biases and outcomes. They go on to say that they're going to, uh, if folks are in particular situations that are affected by this, that they will, you can contact them and get more support. But again, I think that this just goes back to the original conversation that we're having about making sure that there's someone there who can actually answer this question and fix yeah. the problem if there's an issue that's there. Yeah, I mean, I, this is just, I mean, from, from, from my perspective, it's a credit version of the antenna gate. You know, like it just didn't, <laughs> didn't work as well as they thought it would. And then they fixed it on the next one. And, and I think that Apple's, you know, there's going to be some bumps in the road. I think that Apple had to work with Goldman Sachs because Apple liked the reason that Apple didn't work with Verizon. They worked with AT&T because AT&T was willing to give Apple what it wanted to, to make changes to the way a phone works. Uh, Goldman Sachs is, gave Apple a lot, you know, gave Apple a lot of leeway in mm -hmm. a way that no other credit card was going to give. Apple gave Goldman Sachs an AT and T opportunity to go to move into a market extremely quickly, but that was the payoff. That, you know, that was the that was the negotiation, I'm sure, or, or the calculation that a lot of them made um, in that process. And so Apple's getting you know able to continue to move this down the path, and we're, we should expect more hiccups along the way. But I I don't haven't talk to a lot of people that are overall upset about their Apple card and, you know, and, and, and so, and I think that this is again, uh, slowly boiling a, a financial frog that I don't think Apple's done with. Yeah. Another way of putting it is that uh, your point is taken, but another way of putting it is that Apple wanted to open this card on their terms without having to negotiate as hard as they, excuse me, without having to give up as much as they would want to. And, Eventually, they were reduced to dealing with a known to be shifty financial company. So, they um, again, there, there's a lot to unwrap here. There's we, their intentions and the actual results are unknown at this point. But I, uh, my personal thought is that the obligation is on Goldman Sachs to make sure that they make a really, really strong case 
that they they are not guilty of any wrongdoing. And Apple has to continue to make a good case that they did not make a mistake by getting into cahoots with Goldman Sachs. I, I, it makes. I hope I'm not overstating this. It, it might sound as though I'm saying that Goldman Sachs is an evil, you know, jerk company that that, that nobody should touch. But again, they're the the financial the housing the housing lending crisis was not. And oops, it wasn't a oh an unrestricted market. It was <laughs> the FTC agreed that this was malfeasance that mm -hmm. needed a five billion dollar correction. That's something that again, if if that appeared, if uh, imagine Goldman Sachs uh, filing out a credit report and saying, oh well, geez, see here that you were cheating investors out of money <laughs> and also locking individual consumers into loans that you knew that they would not be able to ever pay back. I'm afraid we're not going to be able to give you this opportunity today, Goldman Sachs. He says, feeding it into a shredder. Mm. Uh, but this is this is the the problem that Apple faces. Now, Laurie, do you use Apple Card? I do. Yes. Did you have any <clears> issues <throat> with uh, sign up or anything like that? How have you found the card? I actually, I have so many feels to unpack right now. So bear with <laughs> me on this. First of all, I think that Hanson DHS DHH. Um, he went about all of this completely wrong. And I personally take a little bit of offense to the Apple card is sexist. That bothers me because, you know, being somebody who has faced sexism in my lifetime, um, using this unknown, I don't know why my wife's credit score or uh, credit um, approval was lower than mine. And just throwing that sexism card at it reduces my sexism issues that I've actually had that I know for sure come from something like that. So when I hear this kind of thing, like my hackles are up of like, you know, what do you mean? How can you prove this? And you, and and throwing that out there reduces the times when I say that I've been the victim of sexism. So mm -hmm. I'm immediately upset by that. So, to, so I have to put that out there and say that like, you, you know, he, his first sentence in his first tweet is the Apple card is such an effing sexist program. And you know what that also means? It means that the rest of the internet is going to report that. So he is not a reporter. It's not his job to be unbiased and to be clear and, and you know, say things that are accurate. He's okay with that on Twitter to do that. But the rest of the blogging world jumped on it and turned it into this like rolling boil of what is Apple doing wrong? What is Goldman Sachs doing wrong? When there is very, very little evidence one way or another about the situation. Mm -hmm. So that's to me where everything went wrong, where where the, the crap hit the fan and, and this shouldn't have been reported on the way it was reported on. Because what you've said quite a few times and what I think is actually true is it's not about the Apple card is sexist, which is what everyone reported after he tweeted that. It's that the the credit industry in general is not transparent for us. And specifically in this case, this black box idea of that we just we don't question it. So the people that worked at Goldman Sachs, those those um uh, representatives that he spoke to that kept saying, it's an algorithm. I don't have access to it. I don't know. It's an algorithm. The algorithm is there. I trust that. That's dangerous. And it's good that this is being called into question of maybe there is an accidental bias in here that does need to be addressed. And to bring that to light of like, hey, you know, we need to be looking into whether or not this is a uh, you know, has any kind of bias unintentional, you know, in this locked algorithm that we don't know about. That's the stuff that needs to be reported and not this like blowing up of um, Apple card is sexist. And and so I find I'm, I find the whole thing very frustrating. And I certainly don't want to defend the way Goldman Sachs's algorithm works, or Apple's um, uh, relationship with Goldman Sachs in, in this endeavor, because number one, Goldman Sachs should be a little more transparent and have a better way to access algorithms so that we can understand how those kinds of things are determined. And number two, Apple should, they they are, they're holding hands with Goldman Sachs. So they, they're, their reputation is tarnished when Goldman Sachs' reputation is tarnished, and they need to be—they need to be more proactive about doing something about it. Okay, I think I got it all out. <laughs> Lori, I want to—I want to apologize um, for not leading with you, and I mean that sincerely. We, I oh no, no, I, no, no, it I, actually I really gave should me have time to listen to everyone else's the way <laughs> they addressed it, and and it gave me some more. 
um, information in my own head about, you know, yes, this is true. And no, I don't believe that. And so it was good. I had a good way to, to barf that out. At I'm glad you had time to percolate. <laughs> and, and, and the one thing that I, I'm always surprised by that, that I, that companies don't do at almost every level is pay attention to social scores. So when someone calls you, you should immediately be able to know what their how many Twitter followers they have. Yeah. <laughs> like, 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 but I'm yeah. always amazed at, you know, um, yeah. because, you know, the, the, uh, um, you can always tell the companies that do because they respond very, very quickly mm -hmm. to a lot of these things. And there's a lot of great tools. Uh, Salesforce, I think, bought one called Radian 6 that I think is now something, some kind of social studio or whatever they call it. And there's other tools out there. But I'm always amazed at a hotel, at a restaurant, at a, you know, like that they're not carving, you know, pulling up that information. If some guy who is a founder who has a lot of followers yeah. is, um, calls you, they should literally, in my opinion, go to another person mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like and, <laughs> and, and not be, you know, uh, and, and, and it's just, this is less to do with credit scores and everything else, but just as a company, you should know what the impact's going to be right. to give that person, yeah. uh, you know, they used to say that a yeah. an angry, um, uh, you know, an angry customer would lead to 10, you know, it would hit 10 people. Uh -huh. uh, now it's uh, tens of thousands days, yeah. or hundreds of thousands of people get, and it creates yeah. this huge, uh, process, but, but it's, um, you know, and, and it's not that you can't, you shouldn't treat everybody, you know, you should treat everybody well, but you should, there is a certain level of, um, crisis management that goes into this person can cause a lot of trouble really fast. It can cause a lot of trouble and, and a lot of out. misinformation, which leads right. to more customers being harmed right. in the process or well, potentially harmed in the process. So yeah, I, I, I agree with the concerns about preferential treatment there, obviously, but I do think that there is some impact on making sure that. And I'm not saying that's fair, by the way. Right. Yeah. It's not I'm that just saying that's right. right. It's just good company policy. It's very unfair. The, the, it's very unfair, it's, but it, you it's think very it's very unfair. Idea. But if you're an, if you're a if you're a company that does this, that there are a lot of companies that do it. Like, so let's just be clear. Like, it's not. Uh, this is a very popular thing, and the fact that they're not interacting with this, there's there's a huge number of companies that already uh, are pretty clear what's what's actually happening there. Yeah, uh, the, this is something to continue continue to watch. Of course, like I said, there the department is looking into uh, Goldman Sachs, and so there will be eventually an answer, a clear answer, to make sure that uh, these algorithms that are put in place are doing the right thing uh, and that it's, uh, you know, the, the black box is going to be, I don't know, great a little bit. So we'll be able to see a little <laughs> bit into them. Um, not to keep plugging triangulations, but to keep plugging triangulations. Uh, I also had the privilege just recently of interviewing, um, of interviewing Ruha Benjamin uh, on her book, Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code. And in this book, Ruha Benjamin, who is uh, an associate professor of African-American studies at Princeton, uh, talks about uh, biases in tech and particularly in AI and how the, the very popular data sets on which um, our modern AI engines are built came with a whole lot of biases in place and how even still we think of, of artificial intelligence and algorithms and these things as uh, completely separate from humans. They're computers that just that, that think like Vulcans do. And the fact is they don't. They were created by, and I'm sure someone's going to quibble with me, I understand, but you get the point. Uh, they, are, they were originally created by humans and with the help of humans feeding these data sets and training these data sets. And so the fact is human bias still plays a role in those things. Uh, so that's another a great conversation if you want to, or a or book there. Uh, again, Race After Technology by Ruha Benjamin. Um, so let's go ahead and take another quick break here before we come back and do our picks of the week. This episode of Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by our pals at Plex. Plex brings together all the media that matters to you in a single app. It is available on any device, no matter where you are. You can organize and stream free for your personal collection of movies, TV shows, music, favorite podcasts, web series, news, and more. Yeah, that is a lot. You can, you can check out movies, TV shows, music, podcasts, web series, news. It's got it all. Plex is an all-in-one package that gets you all of the stuff that you want to stream across all of your devices. 
You can give your media the royal treatment it deserves with the Plex Pass with premium features you can bring out the best in whatever media you have. It's like taking all of your media that's sort of existing on these different hard drives and different places that you've collected over time and you put it all in this one place and then Plex goes ahead and takes that feather duster and dusts things off. And sometimes, I don't know if you've ever seen those like Instagram videos of, of an art person, an art restorer working on a piece of art, but suddenly that, uh, that movie that once looked like uh, it was. It, it had been through two wars. It's the Mona Lisa again. It's beautiful. It's recreated. It's wonderful. And that is what Plex does. They restore your beautiful work. Uh, with a Plex Pass, an antenna, and a tuner, you can stop paying for cable. Heck yeah, cut the cord. And enjoy great TV and even record free HD broadcast channels right to your library. Leo's talked before about that's his next, or that's his project for this coming year. He wants to get a really fancy TV tuner, get the antenna, get the Plex, uh, he was already a Plex Pass subscriber, and sort of put those all together and uh, stop paying for cable there. You can use offline accessibility with mobile sync. So if you're on a plane, on a boat, in a submarine, I don't care where you are, uh, with mobile sync, you can sync your movies, your shows, your music, your photos to your mobile device. So you can have that offline enjoyment wherever you go. That's, you, it, right now you want to stream some stuff and there are only certain apps and services that allow the, those, that content to be downloaded. And sometimes it's in standard definition instead of high definition. And it only lasts three days before it gets deleted from your device. There are all these rules and stipulations and things like that. When you're using your own personal media and you're using mobile sync, it stays there as long as you want it there. So when the kid wants to watch the wheels on the bus go round and round, you can count on it being there. There's also premium music, so you'll get uh, special features like lyrics and custom curated playlists based on your music preferences. So when uh, the New Year's Eve party rolls around and you all are feeling like some karaoke, that feature will come in handy. As well as premium photos, so you can make photo albums that you can customize and share. Uh, so you can share your favorite memories on your television or your devices, wherever it is. And this is one of my favorite ones, get cinema-like experience when you're watching your personal movie collection. So you pop in your personal movies and Plex adds trailers. They add special features that you might not be able to get anywhere else, behind the scenes stuff, cast interviews, that's all included. So again, it's taking what you already have and adding even more great content to it. And if you've got multiple users, well, you can use Plex Home to switch between users. So that way you get customized, managed accounts that make switching easier uh, between those users and some parental controls so you can safely let your little ones enjoy too. Henry and Mizzy can't watch some of the films I watch, so I make sure those parental controls are turned on. Uh, with Plex Pass, you also get Plex Pass perks, the three Ps, where you get exclusive access to promos and discounts on partner products and the newest features before everyone else. So Leo and I, of course, were bragging about the fact that we got access to the new UI for Plex before other folks because we are uh, lifetime Plex Pass members, uh, which was kind of nice to get a preview. But it is out now and it's beautiful, uh, nice redesign. And even more features such as loudness leveling, sweet fades, timeline view, and advanced audio features. So are you ready for your Plex Pass? Well, Plex is offering Twit listeners ten dollars off the lifetime plex pass subscription for new subscribers only when you go to plex.tv slash twit and enter the code twit 10 t-w-i-t 10 that's plex.tv slash twit with the code twit 10 so you can get all of your content available on all your devices streaming and dreaming thank you so much to plex for sponsoring this week's episode of mac break weekly all right folks break time is almost over but I do want to tell you about iOS Today. Uh, just recorded that one yesterday, went live today. We had, I had on Russell Ivanovich of Shifty Jelly. He is the co-founder of the company and the co-creator of Pocket Casts, the podcast app that many people use across different devices. So uh, had him on. We talked about the creation of Pocket Casts and where it uh, started. Actually, it started with weather before it was ever, uh, before the company ever created their pocket, their podcasts app. And yeah, it was a really fascinating conversation. And before we talked about the news of the week and iOS and things like that. So be sure to check that out for all things iPhone, iPad, Apple Watch, and more. That's iOS today. 
All righty, it is time for our picks, and I think this week we'll start with Andy. Well, uh, funny you should mention Plex. I've been a, I've been a fan of Plex and user of Plex for years and years and years. All my data is – all my entertainment is on a Plex server, on a, on a NAS. Uh, and recently, I finally, after only <sighs> – Two years of complaining about how I need a universal <laughs> remote because now I've got way too many components I need to switch on and interact with whenever I want to watch a movie or something. Uh, finally decided to finally spend the money on a this a the Logitech a Harmony Companion, uh, which is exactly in the sweet spot of what I want. Uh, the old style idea of and just a infrared remote that you just punch codes into. Well, that's not really worth your money. Uh, this is a totally unified sort of thing uh, comes with a, a little like a little hockey puck sort of box uh, plus an IR blaster uh, because it can not only deal with infrared remotes it can also deal with uh, like Bluetooth wireless remotes so finally for the first time I can uh, push a button on my on this one little unified remote and with the sequence that I've set up on a on the phone app it will turn on my TV turn on my AV receiver switch it to the uh, the input that has my Apple TV on it uh, and then send the right codes to uh, the Apple TV to turn yourself on, get yourself into this app, uh, nice. and it just all works all works really really nicely. You can. Uh, it's not. A, I would like to say that the, don't let the app throw you off. Uh, I think the user interface could be a little bit more polished, but the thing is, it was a lit setting everything up the way I wanted it was a completely linear process without. Huh? How come it's not responding? Huh? How come this isn't turned off? Huh? What? Uh, it really everything every time that I tried to do something, try to set up something like a sequence or say okay this is my music player this is what i want to happen when i press the button on this remote for music for listening to listening to music it was just a very nice linear fashion setup was perfectly fine uh it supports up to eight i think eight different devices the nice thing about this is it also will control uh home lighting and home automation stuff what? so you can also see so yeah, exactly so you can also set it set it to do things like um so it's i'm watching a movie so dim down the turn off the lights in the living room dim the lights in the next room uh turn on the turn on this little backlighting thing switch to this input switch to this so it's it's not you know and i'm making it sound like it's scripting but it really isn't it's just here is a list of things that i want you to do while you do it uh support is it, it's a you don't have to look up codes uh, it supports Everything that I've been throwing at it, and right now I've set up different. Uh, I think I've got seven things set up with it, some of which are pretty darn old. Uh, really, the the only difficulty that I had in setting this up was my Sony Blu-ray player doesn't have the model number printed anywhere on it, so I had to. <laughs> so, so I actually, so I actually had to like go to. I think I bought it from B and H Photo or something. So I had to go back to B and H Photo, look at my order history to get the model number of my Blu-ray player. But other, than, but that, but that, I don't think that's Logitech's fault. Um, the, but the, and the last thing I want to compliment it on is that um, I I had one of the earlier generation uh, Logitech Harmony remotes uh, with, with the kind that was like really really long and it had an L color LCD screen uh, on it. And one of the things that made me not want to use it and really stop using it was the fact that. It you had to really keep it in its charging cradle when you weren't using it, or else it would just die every like three or four days. This is it communicates with that little hockey puck thing via Bluetooth low energy. So the battery in this, I believe, is literally just a little coin cell battery, and it says it lasts about a about a full year. So uh, it's uh, I, I've now I've now managed to replace the TV remote that got destroyed when I left it on a windowsill, and there was a horrible rainstorm that rendered it inoperative. Uh, I've, I've replaced the the two or three remotes I'd have to juggle in order to get things done, and I no longer have to like shout instructions to Guillermo whenever I want to watch something like uh, like uh, Apocalypse Now, which really demands the full lighting effect. Uh, and uh, it's not, it's not the cheapest one. It's, it's about uh, I think it lists for 150, but I got it on Amazon for 110, uh, uh, close to that. I think it was 100 bucks plus tax. Uh, and it's uh, with all the other ones that I was looking at. Uh, it really is worth the extra fifty or sixty dollars you'd spend. In that, uh, many of these will be IR only. It won't be able to control Bluetooth stuff like uh, like the Apple TV. Uh, it it seems like it's very very future forward that I won't have to replace in two or three years when I buy a new component. Uh, and I'm very, very, very happy with it. The only thing I wish it had is I wish this this keyboard were backlit, but I suppose that would kill the the battery life. So oh well. <laughs> And it looks like a remote, which is so nice. Ex Remotes exactly. these days it's, don't look like well, remotes. It's, 
it's curved. It's it's it's, co it's compact. Uh, it also is, it also has this really nice like sort of like plastic rubbery texture on the bottom of it. So you really have it has the uh, a hump right where you want it. It's it is the antithesis of the Apple TV remote. When you pick it up, <laughs> like your your thumb your thumb is falling exactly on the button that you you're most likely to be hitting, like the uh, the D pad for navigating menus. Uh, it's just a very very satisfying object. Very very nicely designed. And and the nice thing also is I, I have the older version, which I'm about to upgrade. And I was like, I wonder if the new version is any good. And then you just did a review. Yeah. And now I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, it, but the, so I have the older version. And the nice thing is, is that all the equipment that goes on my TV is in another room. It's in a server room. So it's somewhere else in the house. And so being able to have a controller that then controls all the equipment and then feeds it back to the, the TV is also useful. It's beyond just the yeah. getting rid of all the controllers, but it's, it's allowing me to uh, have all my equipment somewhere else other than the TV room. So I, all I have is a screen on the wall. I don't have any equipment in the, in the TV, in the right. living room. If, if you, you can hide everything inside a cabinet because yep. uh, again, the IR blaster, if you as the IR blaster is inside the cabinet and it comes That's with what a I have. Very, got a couple wall. of those just hanging there and they do all the right. stuff. They do right. all the it work. has, I, I've actually got mine just perched on top of the, uh, uh, it's power perched on top of the receiver. It's powerful enough. I think it's actually bouncing off the rear wall and then yep. forward again to hit the stuff. But again, if you want to have everything completely hidden out of the way, uh, you can absolutely do that. Yep. Awesome. Uh, all right, let's move on to our next pick, which comes from Laura Gill. What do you got for us, Laura? That's me. That's you. So <laughs> I'm about to fly to Japan on Sunday. I'm leaving Whoa. and I'll be gone for um, 10 days. So it's very exciting, but it's also a very long flight. And Apple briefing of course, in Tokyo. Yeah. Apple briefing in Tokyo. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, live at Budokan, remember? <laughs> Um, oh, yes. Oh. So, right. so the one super awesome thing that has, has been like a great part of my life is AirFly, which is a Bluetooth transmitter that you can plug into any device that has a 3.5 millimeter jack, and it turns that thing into a Bluetooth-enabled device. So it works perfect on planes that have in-flight entertainment. They hand you those little plastic buds that you can use, and you stick them in their ear, and you're, they're wired, and you you know, connect them to the, the TV screen. It's uncomfortable. If you fall asleep, they rip out of your ear. Airfly makes it so that you can actually um, use any Bluetooth device with it. So we, all of your wireless earbuds, your noise canceling headphones, anything you want that's wireless, you connect it and it works. Today, Air, uh, 12 South just came out with an updated version called Airfly Pro, which has a couple super awesome new features that I'm very excited about. One of them is audio sharing. So iOS 13 and AirPods has audio sharing. This has audio sharing and it doesn't have to be an iOS 13 device and it doesn't have to be AirPods. It could be any two Bluetooth headphones and any device. So it can be your iPhone, it can be your iPad, it can be an Android device, it could be um, you know, the, the in-flight entertainment screen, anything you want. Two pairs of headphones connect to it. It's like a, a splitter basically mm -hmm. that will let you use um, two, two different pairs of headphones at the same time. It also has uh, the reverse of a Bluetooth transmission. It's a, also a Bluetooth receiver. Ooh. So you can plug this into anything that doesn't already have Bluetooth enabled. And it, as long as it has a 3.5 millimeter jack, it'll make it a Bluetooth enabled device. A lot of... A lot of scenarios that that uh, 12 South is representing is uh, you you hop in a rental car and you don't want to connect your phone to that Bluetooth stereo, yeah. for example. You plug this in and it doesn't connect that way. It connects to the Bluetooth. I have a car that doesn't even have Bluetooth capabilities, but it does have a 3.5 millimeter audio in jack. It has to be an audio in jack, not a headphone jack. So I hopped in my car and I plugged in the AirFly and now my phone actually can be played through my, my stereo. It's something that it couldn't do before. So it's pretty awesome. That's very cool. Uh, it, it also both. now has, yeah, it now also has 16, more than 16 hours of battery life. So uh, they actually had said that, 12 South had said that they tested it on one of the longest flights that you can take nonstop, which I believe is about 17 and a half hours. I can't, I think it might've been from something like, uh, du like Dubai to Australia or something like that. And uh, it, it, Far, it surpassed it. It made it through the 16 or 17 and a half hours flight plus, but they're saying 16 hours um, just, you know, to give you that kind of, of cushioning. So 
Yeah, this thing is pretty awesome. Uh, Airfly already was really cool. Just it's a great little device. But Airfly Pro now has these extra features that make it really awesome. And uh, I know the the word pro gets thrown around a lot, but I think I'd like to I'd like to say that this one actually deserves that nomenclature just because it really does add some amazing additional features that makes it way better than the other version. And it's only $10 more than the standard Airfly. Yeah, the fact that it does both transmitting and uh, what I don't know broadcast transmission, whatever it Re- does both receiving sides. And yeah, receive, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. receiving a transmission. Yeah. That's very cool. Uh, and I see that there's a review over on uh, iMore for this product. <laughs> of course. Yeah, which uh, again we've got dark mode on iMore, which is nice. Yes, I know it's great. Dun, dun, yeah, there it is dun, with my Nintendo Switch. That's how. That's <laughs> what I tested it on when I was in the house. I. When I did the audio sharing, when it was great, I plugged in the AirFly. I put in some headphones. I made my partner put in some headphones, and we played some video games on it. And we were both listening with our with our uh, wireless headphones instead of you know on the television set or something. It was really fun. Nice, because the Nintendo Switch itself doesn't have a lot of good Bluetooth support, correct? Right. It it does support some Bluetooth devices, but not a lot of them. There's I don't know maybe two dozen tops that it supports. Um, it for example, it doesn't support. Um, uh, I, uh, AirPods. So yeah, I've, I always use an AirFly if I want to use the, um, if I want to play my Nintendo switch with headphones on, cause I just plug it in and I can use it that way. And so, but now I can use it with myself and another person and they can use their headphones to connect to it. And we can both listen at the same time. Fun, fun, fun. <laughs> All right. That's AirFly Pro. And now it's time for Alex. What have you got for us? So I'd like to first thank Chris Hedlund. I, th- I believe it's Chris Hedlund. I, that's his, uh, his uh, uh, Twitter thing. He he suggested it. I've complained a lot about not having field runners working on my on my phone. In fact, I have a phone that oh, I've yeah. updated because I can still play field runners. I love mm-hmm. desktop. I've loved desktop tower defense since the first desktop tower defense on Flash. You know, on my web page, and just for some reason, that's the kind of thing I like to play. And so, but I, I haven't been very happy with most of the desktop tower defenses. And even when he r- suggested it on Twitter. I was like, oh, another another desktop tower defense that I'm not going to like. And I was kind of like, oh, but I'll download it and just take a look at it. We'll just see. <laughs> and um, on my flight back from Washington, D.C. last week, I was like, okay, I'm going to open it and just, just see how it turns out. Five hours later, Whoa. we landed. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> so it was like, like literally an entire flight just disappeared. Oh. You know, like like it was just, it was just <laughs> gone. You know, and I, I'm on level six now. Um, but... So I, it's called Kingdom Rush, and um, and it is, uh, this is a great desktop tower defense. And again, there was a bunch of things I didn't like about it when I first saw it, which is like, oh, I can only put my towers in certain places. I can't, you know, it's really not about controlling the the way the guys run through it. It's like the the very structured ones you'd see in in field runners, and and you can only put your towers in certain places. But I found that a couple of things. One is is that I I really and you know in Obviously, I spent a lot of time playing it, at least in one flight. But also that what was interesting is, is that because there's things you have to do during it, in, in old desk, older desktop tower defense, there are like dead time. Mm-hmm. You know, like you get the, the, the whole thing set up and then you just wait for them to get through certain things because you've got something worked out. Here, you have to be adding what they call reinforcements. You have to add things to it all the time or you're just okay. not going to win. Like you have to, and you really have to think through it about how, you, how you're putting those things together. So it's just a different set of rules. Um and but you really have to throw people into it um or, or little fighters or whatever into it to make it work and so i um anyway so i i really enjoy it it's it's pretty fun and i don't know i don't think i i don't remember paying for it it might have been two dollars or three dollars but i think it might be free to start with I'm, i don't i'm not even sure what i would have to pay for because i haven't i've just been playing it but uh anyway it's great if you're if you like desktop tower defense as much as i do um it's uh, it's pretty good. And then the, the only side recommendation I want to make is that uh, the Mandalorian is pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> oh. We, we, we kind of skipped over that. I haven't had time that. to watch it yet. <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. No spoilers. Ah, I'm just gosh. saying, <laughs> it's great. You know, <laughs> if Disney keeps on doing that, then it's gonna be a good service because it's it's not quite movie. You know, like there's something on with the audio at the very beginning with some of the some of the um voices that I didn't I, I felt were thin like they didn't feel mm-hmm. like a movie mm-hmm. like a feature film kind of thing which is I think I was kind of expecting because the visual effects are outstanding you know just completely 
film quality. Um, and so it felt like the audio wasn't quite keeping up with that uh, at the beginning, but then I sunk into it. And it's, it's definitely one of the best, um, yeah, it's, it's definitely one of the best like digital only releases that I've seen for, for anything. Wow. And, and, uh, and that, and, 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 you know, the character development's a lot better. I just finished watching, I, I took my son to, to the Dolby theater to see Midway. Um, I'm a, I'm a war buff. So, so <laughs> Midway, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's a very important battle, probably one of the most important battles of, the, of World War II in the, in the Pacific. And um, anyway, uh, <laughs> good movie, no care, no, character development oh i see you know like like it was mm -hmm. if, if historically I, I i was glad my son got to see it so he understands you know kind of what happened there i i think it's mostly pretty accurate mm -hmm. as far as the, the bits and pieces probably more accurate than uh, it's definitely more accurate than pearl harbor um but uh there's just not that they did I, I was like it's just interesting how you you write something and there was so many plot lines and they, you know, and there was so much, you just weren't attached to anybody. Right. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. But the visual effects were great. It was, I'm glad I saw it in a big theater. Uh, but this was a completely other thing where the development just really, you know, you just realize what great writing and great Ooh, effects and great, that's exciting. Uh, everything, everything, this, everything so, was great. It's, it's good. Uh, so for kingdom rush, that is uh, free and it does Back have in app purchases, um, which are probably for like little things you can pay to make the, game move faster and stuff like that. Uh, but it's free to download, I think. Yeah, free to download with in-app purchases for like little characters, it looks and, like. And I have to say that I, I've been, I played the first five hours of it and I haven't bought anything. So, and that's usually, if anything charges me to just play, I kind of like, no, like ongoingly. Right. Um, so it's, it's good. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Well, my pick is a new app. Just hit the app store. It's called Food Noms. That's, there it is, F-O-O-D-N-O-M-S. And it is a, a nutrition food tracking app. Um, the thing that, there, there are multiple things that makes this app pretty neat. Uh, it is also free with IAP. Um, with, with, my fitness pal is one of the very popular food tracking apps and it has a huge database of information uh, that makes it pretty easy to log your your food but one of the problems with that is it's plugged into some online database somewhere that is uh you know uh, syncing your information across and you've got all these different privacy policies food noms one of the things that they put forth as the most important aspect of the app is that it is a, a privacy focused app um so except for pulling from the database that exists to to get nutrition information, your data is not going that way. <laughs> the stuff's coming down. Uh, but what I think is very cool about this app is, along with being able to see some really great graphs for your information, is the nutrition label scanning feature. So even if the information is not available in the app, um, in the database that they have available, uh, they take advantage of some of the new computer vision APIs that are in iOS, that were introduced in iOS 13, that were announced at WWDC, to basically, you take a snapshot, you take a, uh, a photo of a nutrition fact label, and it pulls in all of the information from it, the calories, uh, all of that information, but as well as, you know, serving size and things like that. And so you can use that to then inform your, um, your tracking throughout the day. And then of course, my most important feature is that it syncs with the health app. And so all that information is available in my health app, but then also is available to the other apps I use who pull their data from the health app as its database. Um, if you want to up your uh, subscription, they, they've, the uh, Food Noms Plus subscription is $1.99 a month or $16.99 a year. Again, free to download. The Plus subscription is what, where the additions come from. That gives you unlimited nutrition goals and you can uh, track some other nutrition data that are not that's not available uh, with just the normal version, but the plus version. Uh, you could sync, of course, across all your devices. And like I said, that it's the scanning feature that I really like. This uh, nutrition label scanning and the barcode scanner—they're both very quick and very easy ways. I am notorious. I I've talked about this before, but. I don't, I wish I didn't have to eat. I wish that eating wasn't a thing that humans were required <laughs> to do um, because it's just a pain in the tuchus, Um and I often forget to eat. And then, You're eating wrong. And then the Sorry. day, well, so, yeah, thank you. <laughs> As if I haven't heard that every time I say this. Um, sorry, no, no, sorry, if sorry, only sorry. you had tried this one meal, I'm like, no, that's not going to change anything for me. It's just, I, I feel it. 
I love that people love food. You should love food. If you love food, love food. That's great. And there are some meals that are good. But um, if I could go without having to eat, if I could take a pill at the beginning of the day that gave me everything I needed for the day, God, I'd be in heaven. Um, so because of that, though, it'll often come around to 3 or 4 p.m. And I'm like, why am I so tired? And then it's the realization that, oh, my goodness, I haven't fed myself today. Uh, and I need to be better, obviously, about calorie tracking and making sure I'm at least getting the minimum uh, calories that I need in a given day and nutrition. So I'm really trying to stick to that with this uh, Food Noms app and it makes it very fast. So if I'm going in between shows or I'm back at my desk or I'm in transition from being home to walk the dogs and let them out and coming back here, then I can very easily uh, uh, track that. So yes, that is Food Noms. Again, available for free with an in-app purchase. Uh, brand new app to hit the app store. And that is the end of another episode. Uh, so I want to ask, of course, Andy Anotko, WGBH's, or is it W? Yes, WGBH's Andy Anotko <laughs> and Notco.com. If people are looking to get in touch with you, if they want to follow your work, and uh, if they want to check out the stuff you're doing, how can they do all of that? Uh, no show this week because uh, we're being preempted for the impeachment hearings uh, coverage live on WGPH. Uh, but as usual, go to uh, sh check me out on uh, Twitter at Anatko or Instagram or at Anatko, and you'll be able to find my synaptic, synaptic misfirings, reactions, ideas, thoughts, and basically what I do instead of writing. All right. Excellent. And I, Moore's own managing editor, Lori Gill. How can Hi, people... That's me. <laughs> check you out online, check out your work, all that stuff. And do you have anything to pitch? Um, you can find me at Appaholic on Twitter, A-P-P-A-H-O-L-I-K. You can find me at Lori Gill at most of the other social things. And uh, the only thing that I've got to pitch is I'll be uh, on tour in Japan next week. So hope I have a lot of fun. Yay. <laughs> Safe travels. Oh, ramen. <laughs> yeah. Enjoy mm, your I time can't there. wait. <laughs> and enjoy your food there. Uh, I will live vicariously through you in that way. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Lindsay, Pixel Core, and and uh, just massive amounts of 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 technical knowledge that I appreciate getting to learn about every time you I, I'm here with you. Uh, thank you. Where can people follow you online, keep up with what you do, and do you have anything to pitch? I, I don't have anything really to pitch. I, you can find me on on, on both uh, Twitter and Instagram on, as Alex Lindsay um, with an A-Y, not an E-Y. And, uh, and then I started to write some stuff on Medium. I think if you just search for Medium for Alex Lindsay, you can find it. And some stuff on blue collar digital work and e-game, e-sports and live streaming, you know, kind of geeky stuff. I'll probably do more of that. Um, that's about it. Excellent. Uh, well, folks, this is going to be my last Mac break weekly until Aww. the next time Aww. I am needed. Uh, Leo will be back next week. But uh, if you're looking for me online, you can find me at Micah Sargent on pretty much all of the social platforms. You can head to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee. Thank you, Renee Ritchie, uh, which has <laughs> links to all the different things that I do. And I guess my pitch would be to check out Smart Tech Today, a show that we publish, uh, that we, we record live every Monday at 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific. And uh, that is a show all about smart tech, which includes smart home stuff, uh, digital assistance, and everything in between that I do with Matthew Casanelli. Uh, so check that out if you are into that sort of thing or want to get into that sort of thing. Uh, of course, this show records... Uh, let me go find the exact because I never remember the um, the UTC times. Uh, this show records live every Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern, which is 11 a.m. Pacific, which is 1900 UTC. If you head to twit.tv slash MBW, then you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or any other podcast platform, as well as check out the YouTube page there. If you head to twit.tv slash live, that's how you join us live and uh, hang out in the chat if you'd like to uh, and uh, share your thoughts there while we're having our conversation. So we thank you all for tuning in this week and uh, thank you all for letting me join you. I've really appreciated this time. Oh, you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Yep, it was wonderful. Uh, and until next time, it's time to get back to work. His break time is over. <laughs> <laughs>